Screams from the old plantation on stock. Five five bill, five five bill. Screams from the old plantation on stock. Five five bill, five five bill. Screams from the old plantation on stock. So, if you're ready, I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Cool. Thanks for thanks for being on the podcast today. I actually was supposed to ask you like ages ago, but then you're like in the middle of doing your own podcast. You guys were like, oh, yeah, I think you guys yeah. had started Untouched Spaces, and I was like, oh damn, no. I'll give it some time, <laughs> let them settle into theirs. Plus, I didn't yeah. even know what I'm doing, but I am very grateful to have you on the show today, uh, today, Nelly. Um, do you yeah, mind exactly. just just for, <laughs> if if you don't mind, do you mind just giving like a, a just a brief introduction of who you are, and then we'll start yep, from sure. there. Okay, so I'm Gio's cousin. <laughs> oh, of course, half the people on this podcast has been my cousin. That's yeah, how you. That's how you get it, bro. <laughs> um, a little bit about my background, though. I do. Um, so I just graduated last year with a law and arts degree, a conjoint. Sorry. Um, recently, I just finished my professional legal study, so I can be admitted to the high court, and hopefully in November. Fingers crossed. Um, I do a lot of community work, and most of that is based with um, Basifika youth, youth empowerment, a lot of mentoring and stuff like that. Oh, and I also do a lot of social media stuff. So like I have my own podcast, Untouched Spaces, and then I also have a YouTube channel. Nice. <laughs> well, man, yeah. you're a very busy young woman. <laughs> very, very busy. Honestly, I give myself a headache thinking about <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's good. It's good to be busy, yeah. and especially doing the kind of things that you're doing, you know, working for the community, keeping yourself busy with your vlogs and your YouTube channel, oh. you know, mm -hmm. and also the podcast. We'll get all into that, but the week have to start. You're currently in South Auckland, right? Yeah, Margaret 275, yeah. To the, the big, all the way to my heart. But like the, <laughs> but the nice part, eh? Like the manger side of, yeah. of, of, of Margaret. Manger. Like, manger. But you know, it's hey, just... Every part of South Auckland is a nice part. Yeah, that... that... <laughs> I'm biased. I live out in West Auckland, you know, and I've seen, ever, ever since I've moved out west, I'll be like, you know what, man, I love this place. And I've, I'm yeah. seeing more islanders move out west. There's so many Tongans that's moved out west. It's ridiculous. Oh, really? Yeah, it's like, I think in the last two years, I've seen, anecdotal as it may be, but I've seen so many people drive with the Tongan flags on their car. So this is hey. how I'm counting. This is how <laughs> yeah. I'm counting, right? Yeah. It could be just people who bought it during the World Cup, the League World Cup, probably. Hi. Not Tongan at all. But, you know, Today, the Prime Minister has just announced we're going to be in level three here in Auckland for, you know, the next two weeks. Yep. You're kind of right smack in the middle of, you know, where where the so-called, you know, you know, I'm not going to say they're, you know, what their ethnicity is, because that's stupid. The New Zealand family, yeah. Yeah. you know, was identified yeah. to be, you know, to have that positive case of corona. Um, yeah. how, how is stuff down in South Auckland at the moment? Um, Honestly, obviously on social media, there's like... A lot of talk and conversation around that because um, South Auckland, they thought it was irrelevant. And what, like, why were they saying South Auckland family? And also, why were they saying the nationality and stuff like that? Mm. But obviously, it's important with like contact tracing and stuff like that. Um, but then I've seen a movement of um, a lot of people saying why South Auckland is beautiful and South Auckland is beautiful. I'm, no. <laughs> I'm a proud, proud South Aucklander. So I'm not um, shitting on yeah. South Auckland. I'm just saying it's no, my, my preference. My preference is West. Yeah. That's all. Everyone has their own preference. Of course, of course. It's the same as Dogger without. I villages. come to South Auckland. I, I feel very welcomed when I come to South Auckland. I'm just also of glad course. that I leave. <laughs> But like the overall feel in person walking around, going to the supermarket, mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty normal. Okay. Um, we just came from the supermarket. It wasn't busy. There were no lines. So, yeah, that's really nice. Yeah, uh, it's it's crazy to me because I didn't actually pick up on this. And apparently this is something that's been going on is the way that they've portrayed this family. And they sort of highlighted the Pacifica family. And I, I, I get what you, yeah. where you're coming from, you know, in terms of the contact tracing and being able to identify yeah. where it originated from. Yeah. Ethnicity does kind of have... Uh, some relevance to it but then if you look back at other things right you know um who's that guy who did that beat that uh jason derulo stole you know they don't yeah. you know he, he's a good example and someone else you know this is this is something that i was only recently made aware of you know someone else put it up there to say why is this young kid who is clearly not white he's a brown kid you know yeah. why is when all the good stuff happened they're classified he's as new zealanders and the yeah. kiwis 
but yeah. if you know but if you know anything it's negative like, something like, goes a little bit wrong yeah exactly in, in a negative connotation they always identify them as pacifico it's Maori, the same you know it's ytt yeah when he won the award everyone was like he's a kiwi he's a new zealander he's a kiwi he's a man as soon as he does something controversial they're like maori indigenous yeah. well he is so maori <laughs> exactly right yeah so uh, it, it's just funny to me because i just recently picked this up mind you i don't really you know buy i don't really you know follow mainstream news and stuff like that right um, right like I, I do it for sports and maybe like the the important stuff but it, it, yeah. it just it's just something that was like quite interesting at the moment mm. to me mm. it, like, it, i'm really i have a lot of friends who really speak up on things like that so i'm really lucky to be informed in that way and mm. to hear both sides so yeah it's been an interesting it's been an interesting time to um see how the how mainstream media works and how social media works and mm. there's pros and cons to both yeah like definitely pros and cons to both but yeah it has been an interesting time why do you think they do that why do you think when you know like we just mentioned when something negative happens they're very quick to identify the person's skin color the person's yeah. ethnicity if they're non-white um but not so keen to do it when it's in a positive light yeah um I just think it's like the New Zealand, like as New Zealanders, we have this sort of pride. And as soon as something goes wrong, it's so easy for them to just push it on to another culture, another country, another, you know, anything other. Mm. Whereas when it's something that's so great, we're, we're just so, we're a proud country, we are. Mm. Yeah, we're <laughs> and a bit too I, proud. Yeah. And I think as soon as something goes wrong, they just push it away to and throw it to the other. So like mm. the other culture, other country, you know? Um, and it's really sad, but it is a reality. We've just spoken about so many different examples of it. Yeah. It's like they don't want to dirty the, the clean New Zealand name. You know, yeah, clean green which is, New Zealand. Which is so stupid because one of the biggest uh, selling points for New Zealand is how multicultural and accepting they are. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but they're ready Hot to out. drop. You they're should. ready to drop us like a hot sack of shit. You know, if it doesn't yeah, suit, suit the narrative. <laughs> oh, they're man. like, ladies, um, yeah. I see you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Tongan, Tongan dude. You know, but uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's just it's just really funny because I don't know why it it never occurred to me or it didn't sort of stand out to me before mm. this um, mm. but now that i've sort of noticed i'm just like what the heck have i been blind yeah. this whole time and once you do notice it you see it a lot yeah no absolutely yeah. like once that once my eye has my eye like i've got one eye <laughs> once my eyes were opened to that fact you know yeah. i just sort of it, it everything became a little bit more clear you know every sort of news article that's come out recently you know all these other things they you know, the only part they mention, if they only mention ethnicity, only if it's, you know, if they have to. You know? Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. if they're New Zealander, they claim them as, as being Kiwi. That's all they are. That's all they, they, they have been, you know. Yeah, you know, I know. Forget about, I know. Forget, forget about their ancestry. Forget about their their history. You you know? it. Yeah. That, that's just, yeah. I, I'm still sort of like, it just, it's still blowing my mind that that's, I'm not surprised though. Like, it's something that I'm not surprised about yeah. coming from the media but it's just weird for me that i didn't pick up on that a lot more earlier but i guess uh -huh. you know. i think that's what's difficult in new zealand because it happens everywhere mm. but in new zealand we're so like we have the image of being so diverse inclusive so it's real undercover what mm. they're doing yeah and I mean, once you see it you can't unsee it fingers crossed it's only sort of like a select group of writers and sort yeah. of reporters oh, yeah. that do that oh, yeah. um but it tends to be the ones who have quite a lot of power quite a lot of influence that uh, that their stories are getting out there, which which is unfortunate because in terms of the image for Pacifica, you know, it's not helping us when when our communities do great stuff, we get mentioned mm. only as Kiwis but not as Pacifica, you know, and we yeah. identify as Pacifica, you know. Yes, we're New Zealanders, but mm -hmm. we also, you know, we also are Pacifica. We have a long heritage that goes way past, you know, yeah, New deep, Zealand. Deep yeah, yeah, we definitely got a long, long, deep history. So. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate, but you know, it's it's one of those things that maybe needs to be reevaluated, or maybe it's an issue that's been going on for such a long time, and people have been trying to change it, but it hasn't been that successful. I don't know. Yeah. I'm I'm new to the party with this one, so we'll see we'll see how things go. Yeah. Yeah. Hot out. Yeah. Hot out. So, do you think there'll be any sort of? No, not that I'm continuing to shit on South Auckland. I don't know why this is turned <laughs> to like a South Auckland bashing podcast, but <laughs> but uh. <laughs> 
<laughs> but um, do you think, you know, because South Auckland has been highlighted as sort of like the epicenter of it at the moment, mm -hmm. um, do you think that's going to have any any negative impacts on, on the communities? Like, do you think in the, looking down the future, do you think? Yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, what I'm seeing on social media, people are still very proud and stuff like that. But like we have, I think all the active cases are in South Auckland. I think they kept at Jet Park, which is in Mangere. Hmm. So already we definitely are where a lot of the cases are. We have the airport where all the yeah. international cases come through. So things like that, we're already, it's already quite unsettling with mm. um, COVID and stuff like that in South Auckland. But, you know, I think as an area, we're handling it really well. Um, my home, so I'm sorry if you hear anything in the background, the whole whanau's home because of... That's all right. I had, to, I had to shush my kids yeah. and, and step yeah. into the room. That's okay. I just walked to every bedroom like, please be quiet. <laughs> like, who are you talking um, to? I'm just talking to Gio. Oh, it doesn't matter. Just... Yeah. <laughs> Say it. <laughs> 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 oh, man. But yeah, as a as a household, we're we're doing really well. So mm. just off of that, and from what we've seen going out and about a little bit, we're, it's looking fine. Oh, yeah. that's good. That's good. I'm I'm glad to hear that. And that that's that's also something that's not surprising as well. South Auckland has always been a strong, tight knit community. Super resilient. Yeah, yeah super and, resilient. And, and very well. resilient too. And that's a good point you you point out. I mean. There's no vaccine for the virus at the moment, and mm -hmm. the airport is located in South Auckland. We've just recently yeah. started getting, you know, repatriate. What's the word I'm looking for? Repatriation. That's the one. <laughs> God that, that's, it's close, yeah. close enough. I think what you said was closer than what I said. Um, you know, we've only started doing that recently, and we've those have been our active cases that's been coming back. Yeah. So it makes sense that eventually we would have an outbreak again a yeah. secondary outbreak not to mention those yeah. dickheads that's been jumping the fence and running out oh of my fires. gosh don't even give me man where's, where's the south it. auckland justice there man yeah i know bye -bye. <laughs> no, me, 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 me. Honestly, <laughs> no. No. it just makes me so frustrated you know i mean no, i can i get you know the story i heard was you know it was a family they had their father pass away and they wanted one more chance to see him before i think before the funeral or stuff like that and they only had yeah. You know, maybe I don't know a short amount of time before they're allowed to go. They were just waiting mm -hmm. for the go ahead. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, look, I can empathize with those people, but man, just seeing what's on the line, you know, yeah, what's the possibility, literally, and know, seeing what's going on in other countries, it scares me. Exactly. You know, no, you know, we all know someone who's sort of elderly, who's vulnerable, yeah, who's going definitely. to be someone that's going to be at high risk if there's a secondary, mm -hmm. um, secondary, you know. Uh, uh, spread of the virus yeah. yeah you know um and sort of actions like that just really really annoys the shit out of me i get what you know, I, I i can empathize right i can definitely yeah. empathize with oh, what they're doing but i think it was a stupid stupid decision on their part really selfish yeah, yeah. and um i've read that basfika and maori are already more vulnerable to covid which makes me even more scared because our communities have one more reason to be more careful because we are more vulnerable to COVID. Yeah, it's not like we weren't vulnerable to other shit as well. <laughs> you know, I know. Let's just, let's just spread them on top of a bit of, with a bit of Rona. <laughs> you know, just let's add that into the mix because it's not like, oh, yeah. yeah. But I guess that's the, that's the thing, right, is that we kind of recognize that we are more vulnerable. I mean, you know, yeah. not only, you know, maybe the physical aspects of it all, but, you know, it seems the virus tends to run rampant in in sort of overcrowded homes, um, people yeah, in yeah. poverty, you know, yeah. um, poor access to health care. And we yeah. kind of, you know, our, our population and our people um, kind of sit in that space. Yeah. Know? So it yeah. makes it even, you know, it's just like an extra, you know, extra mm -hmm. thing that's sort of unfortunately happening now that's sort of like, damn, I wish, to, it, wasn't, I wish it wasn't cities, happening. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, is, it is really sad hearing all the stories of the people who are missing funerals and that. I mean, here at home, um, Bala l lost his mum during lockdown in Tonga, and he couldn't fly back. Like, it's really difficult what's mm. going on, and it really breaks my heart. Even us, we have our uncle Jeffrey who's in a rest home, mm. and he rang yesterday saying he's not allowed visitors anymore, and he's really gutted. Like, for a lot of the elderly, their visitors are what makes their day, you know? So, mm. yeah, what's going on really now? 
although our uh, physical well-being is really hard, but also our mental well-being, it's mm. it's really tolling on a lot of people. So yeah, it is a really hard time. Yeah, that's a hard one, especially yeah, yeah Uncle Jeff. Shout out to Uncle Jeff, by the yeah, way. Yeah, hard out. Know. Shout out to Uncle Jeff. I'm going to get him a Spotify account just so he can listen to this podcast. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure he'd love to. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, you know, one of the, I've worked in a rest home before, and and loneliness is quite a a, a debilitating yep. factor to why. You know, unfortunately, people in rest homes, you know, um, pass away. They become depressed. All these other issues that come that yeah. go hand in hand with that. And now, you know, it's it's one of the things now that the virus has sort of reemerged in our in our country. Now yeah. that loneliness will just you know be further in, you intensified. Know, yeah, intensified more. So it it just sucks. I'm, I'm just sort of just complaining out loud about how this is. Yeah, you know, I, I guess we're <laughs> just. I think we may have just been a bit too. I'm not going to say complacent, but I guess maybe ignorant to the fact that the risk was actually quite high of it coming yeah. back because, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, we managed to get on top of our cases. You know, we managed mm. to sort of, we had like 102 days of no new cases. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that, that was amazing work. But then in between all that stuff, we kind of went back to our day to day life like nothing had happened. No, know? literally, yeah. You know, so it's like, yeah. I guess, you know, I mean, what else could you do, really? You know, I mean, there's no vaccine, you know, there's no active cases. Why why shouldn't we go back to our normal day-to-day -day life? But, yeah. You know, then, then, but I guess, I guess for me, you know, in my mind, it's like, shit, I didn't really, you know, I knew there was a risk, but, you know, I didn't think it would happen. And maybe I was just being no, no, same, optimistic, same. you know, but it's here now. It's here now. And I guess we're going to be in level three for the next two weeks 12 more days yeah. i think yeah 12 possibly more days. do you think do you think we're gonna go longer than that i mean i'm hoping we don't <laughs> but i'm not sure mm -hmm. it just depends on how well new zealand works together as a team <laughs> literally that's what literally it's well people just need to stay the fuck home you know no people, yeah people please just need to... This is wash a PSA, please. Yeah. <laughs> you need to wash your hands, you know, shower three times a day. Forget about the drought. You take that extra shower. You take that extra shower, you... bro. Wash your supermarket nachos. Bro, honestly. Man, this is that <sighs> another complaint is like that's not I'm not looking forward to. It's like having to clean my shopping after Yeah. I did you guys do that? Like when you did shopping, did you guys wipe it all no, down? Yeah, Damn, you no. guys just playing with fire, eh? This <laughs> <laughs> Living life on the edge. Far out. You know, we like to do a little few things risky now, Joe. Yeah. We yeah, no. We, we don't, I didn't even think of doing it, actually. I just thought of it now when we were talking about it. My wife, uh the sling my wife like you don't know her. Honey was doing that. Um and she was oh, really? thought about it. I didn't even think about it. I was like, Oh nah, just get it from the shop. We should be all good. I'm wearing gloves. Yeah. But it makes sense yeah. because I you know, people go to the supermarket, they take out a bread, have a look at it, put it back yeah, in. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like why did you market. have to touch it? And and but you know it made me self conscious because Honey would point that out. I was like, "Why are you touching that? You don't need to touch it. You can you yeah. use your freaking. You know eyes. what you want. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Why do you need to pick it up and have a look and then put it back? That's such a huh. unhygienic thing to do. You know. <laughs> okay. Huh. Okay, but like, yeah. So fingers crossed. You know, in the next two weeks, we get on top of the numbers. You know, I think we're gonna extend longer. We may, my hope is that we don't elevate to level four. Oh yeah, I, mean, I I see benefits to level four. No traffic for one. I loved it. Yeah. Because I okay, still like to go to work, work up. bro. <laughs> but like, it's yeah. I mean, I'd rather work. I'd rather not work at all. But then this is me sitting here with a a guaranteed job. So a little bit of sitting from a place of privilege at the moment, you know. But, yeah, yeah. But man, the traffic, like having nothing on the road. And it must look, be nice, bro. Like as a new driver. As a, new As a new driver, you can appreciate it. Yeah, I, I can appreciate bro, that. Bro, you must be so happy about that, eh? You must yeah, be so I'm hot out. I'm that. like cruising around my head, like. Yeah. So the people who don't know, the people, who, the people who are wondering what we're talking about, Janelle just actually got her own vehicle for recently, yep. her first car. My first she doesn't car. even have a license, by the way. No, I have my license. Wait, a learner's doesn't count. I don't count. <laughs> a learners. full target license counts. <laughs> Okay. Kidding. This, Kidding. This, yeah, okay. I have my learners. If you have, if okay, let me just put this out there. As a person who drove around New Zealand on a Tongan license for a long time, here, let me just give people some sound advice. A, overseas licenses only valid for twelve months. 
if you leave yep. if you leave the country back and forth, that twelve months renews every time you come back into the country. But that that max twelve months. You oh, can, I didn't know all of this. Yeah, this is how I this is how I found out because I got a massive fine after driving around for like two years on my Tonga license oh, without okay. going back to Tonga. <laughs> and um, so and then you can convert it straight to a full. That's what I did in yeah. the end. You can convert it straight to yeah. a full. It, it's it's they have, a they're a bit more strict now. Yeah, because um, they found the loophole to and they had to get documentation from Tonga. Bro, how did you get your yeah. license in Tonga? Did you do the? Should we... Um. <laughs> I don't have a Tongan license. <laughs> oh, yes, you don't have a Tongan license. Hint, hint, hint. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I'll say it. I say it. I knew someone who knew someone who got me a Tongan license. <laughs> I knew someone. Yeah, well, that's... I was... I'll, that's I'll, the I'll tell you this. <laughs> I, was in, I was in New Zealand when I got my Tongan license. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <you. laughs> that, that is... That is a, if that doesn't explain it, you know, I don't know how much detail I need to give everyone. <laughs> So I think everyone gets the picture. Yeah, yeah. I'm hinting a bit too much to that one. <laughs> so let, let, let's step away. Let's step away from the coronavirus because I know it's been done to death on every single fucking podcast I've listened to. Yeah, right, it's just yeah. Corona this, Corona this. Yeah. I, I guess I brought it up because it is a new development here in New it's Zealand. Super calm, yeah. I mean, so, we just had the announcement. Yeah, we literally just had the announcement, yeah, around yeah. 530 um so listen let, let's 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 take a trip to to uni you know mm -hmm. what what made you decide mm -hmm. to go into law, law of, of all the subjects that's available that was available yeah. to you as a as a young you know bussy woman going through baradine yeah. college yeah why law um you know i actually really struggled to answer this question because initially i wanted to go to aet and do communications um and then as a last minute decision, I was just like, oh my goodness, because I really also wanted to do Pacific Studies right. at Auckland Uni. And I made, I made a bad um, assumption that an arts degree wasn't enough. Mm. <laughs> um, and that was on me as a year 13. I just thought, you know, I won't get a job with just an arts degree. So I thought if I do law and arts, it'll beef it up. And also with a law degree, I knew that it would give me a pathway that could give back to my community a lot to if be, I decided to, to go that way. To, to be slightly fair, it is hard to get a job with just an arts degree. <laughs> I mean, it's getting better. It's getting better. It's definitely here. getting better. It's, it's definitely <laughs> getting better. Like having an arts degree supplementing whatever else degree you have actually gives you quite a large advantage. Over yeah. things. And it could be a stepping stone. Usually arts degrees are a stepping stone into other sort of fields. Um, my, last, my last guest, I think... Uh, got into psychology after completing his arts degree so it's definitely a, oh, a stepping stone into okay. a lot of stuff yeah yeah but yeah aside from that i knew that law would be a great way to give back to my community so hmm. i just thought why not give it a shot yeah. and i made it to the end <laughs> yeah how long was that by the way oh it took me five and a half years wow. so i started 2014 and i finished last year wow Graduated. five yeah. and a half years yeah, yeah, I know. How hard it's was it? Take, well, they say it takes five years, but listen to me when I say this, it's it's a lot to do it in five years. So I did the extra semester just so that I didn't cruise through. It was hard, but mm. it was a little bit easier having that extra semester. So the closest thing I can relate um, law degrees is episodes from Suits. So... Oh, okay, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> so... I mean, I guess, I guess, you know, the question I want to ask, like, is, is how competitive was it to get into, uh, to, into law? Oh, it's super competitive. So I think first year there's about over a thousand students who take part one law. And then it's the jump from part one law to part two law, which is really competitive. Cause when I, when I did it, it's different now. They, they allow more students in, but when I did it, it was just over a thousand students and they went down to 300. A thousand down to three hundred. Holy yeah. crap! Yeah, so it was really competitive, which is which also made my uni because it doesn't stop there. It's competitive the whole way through because everyone wants the best marks in like in a law paper to get an A grade. I think there's only like two people who can get the A grade, so it's competitive the whole way through. You mean and, there's only two people allowed to get an A grade? Yeah, because it, it's like a bell curve. So in order to make sure the um, marks are given out evenly. There's only about two to three spots, I'm pretty sure, that get like an A grade. That that that's a bit confusing because what if more than two people 
complete whatever assignment or exam and get the same marks like how how do they then sort of divvy out yeah. who gets a pluses and who that's so weird <laughs> I have no idea. I'm sure I'm gonna have to ask. No, no, that's, that's okay. I mean, it's it's just yeah. it's just so odd. I mean, like, I don't yeah, know, it's like, so competitive. Is is it? Uh, I was about to say, is it because to help minimize competition? But I don't know how that will work. That was just a stupid idea that came to my head. Yeah, I don't that's know. That's odd. Maybe I'll ask Saya. Maybe I'll ask Saya because yeah, maybe he'll know he'll actually a little bit know. more. But, but um, um, it's yeah, it's super competitive and it's real individualistic, which is totally against everything I am. Like not, I'm so a village person. Yeah, I'm mm. so like everyone's helping everyone. It's for the better of betterment of everyone. And then I went into law school and I was like, what the heck? No one wants to help me. <laughs> it's a useful, it's a useful thing to have too. Because I had a my last uh, in my last conversation with um, Chris, who's who's the psychologist. We had uh -huh. a conversation about the differences and the benefits. The, well, the benefits and negatives of collectivism and and um, being an individual, you know, and yeah. trying to marry that up. And yeah. I guess law would be that opportunity to try and evolve as an individual, right? Yeah, it was a cool school, cool skill to learn, mm. but it was a difficult skill to learn, also. Because I guess being the best individual you can be, you could also use that to contribute to the collective. You know what I mean? So yeah, you always enough. have something a lot That's more true. to bring back to the group as opposed to yeah. sort of, you know, just everyone just getting the same stuff and, you know, going yeah. about it in the same marks. There is something to say about being an individual and being the best that you can be and being able to use that to help the community. The yeah, the collective. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's interesting. Were there a lot of um, Pacifica during your time in law? Um. There's a lot more now. Mm. I think when I made it into law school, there was like under 20 of us in my cohort. Out of the thousand? Um, yeah, out of the 300. Oh, 300. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, like, sorry. So, a thousand people applied for it, only 300 get taken. Is yeah. Correct? Yeah. Okay. After your first year. And then, yeah, my cohort, there was like, I'm sure there was under 20 of us. And then, but now I think they, I think there's like 40, 30. That's around that good. yeah that's really good and it's really cool for our community the, is <laughs> that is that due to um uh choices made outside of the influence of the university or is it um is, is there more advertisement or special placements for pacifica what yeah the jumping um, numbers um there are a lot more students coming through, bus speaker students coming through general, which is really cool to see. And then we also do have the targeted admission scheme, which has been made bigger. Okay. So what's, so, the, so what's that targeted admission scheme? If you um, targeted admission scheme um, is for, the, there's a Māori one and a bus speaker one. And that's for students who don't quite make um, the GPA that's required or the cutoff after the students. But they show, they do um, interviews and they show a lot of promise and so they're let through through the scheme. And okay. everyone I've seen who's come through it have been amazing and definitely deserve their spot at law school. Mm. Um, and that's just an equity equality thing. That's why we have the, um, it's an equity issue. That's why we have the TAD yeah. scheme or the TAD Yeah, I mean. It wasn't too long ago I was hearing there was a lot of flack being given. I think it was mostly for the School of Medicine where yeah. there was a lot of people uh, complaining about schemes like that or schemes similar yeah. to that where there were certain positions open and given to certain ethnicities um, as yeah. compared to others who may have gotten the mark but couldn't sort of get through because of obviously limited spaces and how competitive it is. Yeah. What do you think about that argument that, because there is an argument out there to say that, you know, there, there's a certain standard of, of what you need to do in order to get into a program, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you don't meet that standard, then maybe you're not going to be able to handle the program. So what's your thoughts about yeah. having these sort of um, schemes, which is, is listen, on, on the face of it, I, I, I can understand the benefits of it and trying to get mm -hmm. more representation in there. But mm -hmm. do you think? Well, what do you think of, an, of of this idea that because that scheme brings people, you know, whose probably marks weren't enough to get there, that it yeah. possibly can be setting them up to fail? Yeah, um, I think more often than not, um, the students who do make it in through the scheme are really close, mm. super close to the mark. Mm. And then on top of that, 
like I said, it's an equity issue. So as a bus figure, we have so many more responsibilities um, in our day-to-day -day lives that a lot of other students won't have. So we have commitments to our church, commitments to our family. Um, if there's a funeral, the funeral goes on for two weeks, you know? So it's these kind of things that happen through our academic journeys that do push us back automatically mm. and stops us from going to uni and cultural things like that. That, mm. um, But then there's also things like socioeconomic underlying things that also affect us. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different things that Pacifica students face that a lot of other students don't face. And the same goes for Māori. So I think those places are really deserved. Mm. And as a student who has watched and been through it and everything, all those students that I've seen have been like amazing. And mm. a lot of them are now working at big law firms, um, lawyers at um, councils and for the um, police department. So they're all doing amazing things. So I think that's reason enough, or sorry, um, evidence enough mm. to show how important those places are and how amazing the outcome of them have been. Mm. That is, that's, and it makes sense to me, you know, as, as someone yeah. who's, who's grown up and going through nursing school and seeing all the available, you know, the, the lack of representation in yeah. not only just, you know, Pacifica, but Pacifica males, especially yeah. in nursing. I, I, I definitely see that. Um, I guess... The issue, it's not really an issue. The sort of ideas that I sort of um, formulate when I think about these schemes is that mm -hmm. there are very similar issues that happen with, with a lot of ethnicities, like um, like Indians or, or Chinese people who come from overseas have a lot of stuff yeah. that happen in the background. You know, some, you know, they fall into, a majority of them do fall into, and fall into that sort of, uh, that, that um, category in our society with, in, in terms of poverty, the cultural aspects, the funerals, all that stuff. Yeah. And I guess what they're able to do is, is, is still manage to progress through and make it through these programs without similar schemes. And I guess mm -hmm. what I'm thinking is, is why can't Pacifica do the same? You know, it, it's just, I don't know whether it's something you, you've ever thought about or, or whether yeah, it's no, something it's not, that's been brought up it's, before. It's not something I've thought about, yeah. yeah. It, it's just it's just anything. Cause so, like, it, and it's not, it, it's nothing to, and it's, you know, it's not me shitting on the Pacifica people because they, they can't do it. I, I believe 100%, and I've said it in many of my podcasts, that I believe yeah. we have more than enough, you know, more capability than some to sort of compete mm -hmm. in those spaces. Mm -hmm. But I guess what I'm trying to sort of think of is how do these group of people who have the exact same, probably not the exact same, because you can't say people have the exact same upbringing and, and sort of life experiences, but have similar oh, yeah. life experiences and, and sort of similar barriers to what we have, yeah. but still manage to sort of have high numbers of people that go through law um, without similar schemes, you know? So it's just sort of like, how do they do it? You know, is it a mentality thing? Is it a value thing where they sort of value it higher above other other stuff? You know, mm. what, what is it, you know? And I guess, uh, and I don't have the answer, you know? you know? Yeah, that's something I'd have to think about before you know? I promise it on because I, I haven't really thought about that, yeah. but yeah. It's just an what interesting one because I do think we are more than capable of competing in that space. And, and then you're a good example of that, you know? And, and I know the people that's gone through law school are, are very evident of that, you know? Yeah. You know, there's a lot yeah. of amazing Pacifica people that's come through law school that are doing amazing things right now. You know, some yeah. come through the scheme, I some come through, not through the scheme. You know, so yeah. we're definitely there. It's just an interesting, um, I guess, a thought exercise, maybe, is what you could call it. Yeah. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So did you do... Okay, so it's, it's good to know that we're getting more people coming through. How do you think we can get more Basifika people interested in law or interested in that field of study? Um, there's actually a program at the moment that the Pacific Island Law Students Association are running called, oh, it's not run by that association, sorry. It's another um, group within law school called the Malosi Project, and they go to high schools and speak about um, law school and how um, the law affects our communities and why it is a viable option for our people to go and study law. And um, yeah, really pushes um, that message through to uh, high school students. So that's one thing that um, Pacifica students are already doing at Law University of Auckland. Um, but other than that, I think the best way is by example. So mm. like we have so many amazing lawyers. We have, uh, we now have, I think two Tongan judges and one Samoan judge. 
don't quote me on that. I think that's how many we have. Um, here in we New have, Zealand. Yeah, yeah, in Auckland, in Auckland. In Auckland. So I know um, Ida Malosi and Solana Moala. I think those are the two female judges we have at the moment. Um, and then we have like so many. Well, I say so many, but uh, for what for New Zealand now, or for what we have had, we now have a lot of um, Pacifica lawyers. And I think it's that example that they. Um, have and the influence they have on the younger generation if they do reach out that's amazing i think that's the best way to to show it definitely leading by example is is a very powerful one um yeah because we do tend to mimic what we see in our in our environment as opposed to being Mm. told what to do and and sort of you you've had a very you probably be able to answer this question a lot more better than i because i went to school in in tonga You, you 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 did all your high schooling here in in New Zealand, do you yeah. think um, because you managed to get go to quite quite a you know prestigious high school, Bairdine College? Do you think that played a big part in your decision into going into law, as opposed to because you know comparing to sort of public schools and private right. schools? Yeah. Do you think being able to go to Bairdine and going to a good school helped mm-hmm. influence what you wanted to do and eventually into law? Um... Not really, actually. I I think out of all the students at my year level, there's only about three or four of us who went to law school. Mm. Um, And I also talked to my careers advisor, and I asked her at the time, and she was like, really? Do you really think that's a good option for you? And that was more fire for me to be like, you know what? I'm going to do it. Stuff you. I'm going to do it. (laughs) Literally. What kind of careers advisor is that? What the hell? Yeah, I know. Literally, sure. I think, yeah, I don't know. I, Actually, yeah, I'm not I think, trying to call her out, but <laughs> I think you did bring this up in your podcast, didn't you? You guys, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Were, I did. Yeah, I think you guys did, and I was actually shocked. I was like, "What kind of useless bloody careers advice?" Careers advice, like, yeah. So I know. like, are you sure you want to do this? Because like, really, are you sure? Do you think that's <laughs> the right option for you? I was like, "Oh, you know what? I'll show you." <laughs> was she white or brown? Uh, she was white. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm just but gonna, yeah, it I'm wasn't just really the that. school. Pardon? No, no, I was just about to say, I'm just going to leave that 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 there, knowing that yeah. she was white. I'll just leave yeah. it there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, but it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't the school at all. I remember telling our cousin Alice, you know, I'm thinking about going to law school, and Alice was like, no, Janelle, like, it's not you. She really wanted me to do communications. But I don't know, I just had this, like, feeling hmm. what, that I really wanted to do it. What, what is communications? I, th- I think someone really uh, explained that to me. Yeah, what, what exactly is it? Yeah, um, they give it, they do a really good um, degree at AUT of communications, and it's like public relations, journalism, ah. all that kind of stuff, yeah. Okay, I can, Radio. See that. I can see that being you, but I guess at the same time, sometimes being told you shouldn't do this kind of <laughs> stokes the yeah, fire. Like, yeah, are you serious? you telling me I can't do this? But I, in hindsight, I'm really, really happy I did law. Hmm. I learned so many good skills. I met an amazing group of people. I have some of the best friends from law school. So, yeah, I'm, and I have a good knowledge of, you know, law and how it works. And so, yeah, I'm really blessed and I'm really lucky that I made that decision and I've made it through. There's a lot of people that go to law, that go through uh-huh. law school, but don't yeah. end up being lawyers. They usually uh, yeah, use it. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, like, it's 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 an interesting, you know, because there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's to me, the only thing I can compare it to is what I've done, which is nursing. And it comes like, you do a nursing degree, then you don't become a nurse. Like, how does that work? It's not good. Yeah. Well, well, I guess it, well, hopefully someone can explain it to me. But like, it, it's sort of, because obviously the law degree doesn't, you don't necessarily always have to get onto the bar and become a lawyer and mm. do that. You know, what else, mm. what else can you branch off from uh, your law degree, um, aside from being a lawyer, what else could you do with that? Um, there's heaps of stuff. You can go into policy, um, employment. Uh, like, there's a lot of careers that use that say if you have a law degree, then you can go through that. Um, like a lot of government procurement, uh, employment relations. There's heaps of stuff. I guess it'll be helpful in business too, right? Yeah, totally, totally. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, did you also do a lot of mentoring? Oh, sorry. The question I was going to ask as well, um, during your mm-hmm. during your time uh, in, in law school, um, yeah. 
did you find a lot of mentors that that helped you through that? I know you kind of mentioned at the beginning it's very competitive and yeah, there there's it tends to be like this individualistic approach to how you you do the degree. But yeah. did you manage to find any mentors? I guess and more specifically, any Pacifica mentors out there that helped? Yeah, hundred percent. So we're at law school because there's we're such a small community in comparison to the whole of law school. Um, we have the I briefly touched on it before, but we have the Pacific Island Law Students Association, mm, right? And that was the best thing I could have signed up for because they just gave all the support. They run workshops because there's a whole executive committee who look after it. And they have they run workshops. They work closely with the. Um, there's a bus speaker team at law school who specifically look after the bus speaker students. So yeah, we're really well supported. Oh, I feel. Good. That's good. Did you end yeah. up working for them? Did you mentor as you went along as well? Um, in my later years, yeah, I did a little bit of mentoring for the part one and part two students, and that was a program run by Pilsa. What was the biggest, I guess, barrier? Did I, I guess this all, you also sort of uh, fall into this question. Do students, especially Pacifica students, find when they come through law? Um, barrier to what? I, I guess sort of um, maybe completing the program, maybe it's the studies, uh, right. maybe it's yeah. um, the concept of what they're doing. Yeah. Um, is there sort um, of... I think the biggest barrier... I don't know. It's quite it's it's quite a draining degree. Like there's so much reading. The classes are sometimes two to three hours long. Um, you can have a day that goes from the morning to the evening. You've got assignments all the time, and, and you have compulsory tutorials. Like it's really full on, yeah. and I think that is what's quite. I think that's the biggest barrier because, as I touched on earlier, we have so many other commitments already outside of uni mm. that that we have in our personal lives and just keeping up with that constant grind of law school is really difficult so what kind of assignments do you guys do in law school like do you guys um it's mostly it's mostly written like written. Uh, okay. opinions and stuff like that but we have a compulsory moot which is like um a fake or oh, not a fake it's like a um, oh yeah it's kind of like a fake court scenario and you yeah, have a yeah. defense like a yeah, role so, playing, like a role playing sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, right. So we we have one in a few papers that we take, and then we have a compulsory one that we have to take. And I did the Pacific Moot, which was actually a really cool experience. Okay, so what, <laughs> so what did you guys have? So what, this, was someone charged with a crime, <laughs> and then you oh, had to nah, argue it, was, it, it was or was it just like a law. debate? Was it like a debate about yeah, sort it, of? It was it was constitution law. So we had two. I was um I was the lawyer for the. Uh, I've forgotten already. We have two parties, and it was something to do with the constitution law in this made-up Pacific Island country that we had right. to go back and forth on. Yeah. Okay. And sort of constitutional law is that like arguing? Um, I'm guessing the constitution or how the way yeah, everything is how set the, up, the government is set up and yeah, how the okay. constitution was interpreted in a certain right thing that happened in the scenario that's very relevant to hear because you know just straight away the treaty of waitangi springs to mind and sort of the interpretation of that yeah that you know because a lot of our especially in healthcare um i guess in law as well it, it's quite intertwined into laws and how we sort of approach yeah. our subjects so that's interesting because I, I guess interpretation is a very <laughs> is a very broad sort of um view well i guess not a view it's, it's it's a very sort of difficult thing to do because everyone can read you know two people the law can read, differently yeah could can read the yeah. same piece of legislation and come to two different sort of um yeah opinions or maybe like interpretations of what that law means so, so yeah. how does that work so like two people read the same thing right and yeah. they both come to sort of conclusion a and conclusion b how yeah. do they argue that like how would you argue your okay. side yeah, so with a piece of legislation, you have to look to the um, reasons for the legislation and why the government have put it there and why they use it. So that's usually at the beginning of the legislation, how they want it to be read, the reasons for it and stuff like that. So that's meant to help with interpreting. There is also an interpretation act. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so a whole piece of legislation to help you with interpreting. And then sometimes they also go back to 
um, the parliament debates about the legislation to understand how government intended the legislation to be interpreted. Why would you want to argue a legislation? Like, what, how, how, in what scenario would that sort of be where, like, you go to court and, like, someone's, like, arguing this piece of the Constitution? Is, is there, like, a certain I don't know. setting I feel for like that? that doesn't... I don't feel like that... That happens? Does it? Does that even happen? <laughs> I don't... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't have... I wouldn't have any clue. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it may happen if it becomes relevant in terms of may, maybe a business. Uh, Iumatao may be a, a good example of that, of having that land and maybe certain constitutions and, and laws prohibit, yeah. you know, that land from yeah. being used due to sort of like the spiritual significance of it all. And mm. you have to find somewhere in the constitution that sort of backs that up possibly. Is that sort yeah. of like a scenario that may be, a, may be something? I mean, yeah, plus I, I think with Ihumata also they how they tried to make it a heritage, have, have made, um, put down as heritage, but the act didn't cover that area as heritage. Do you remember that? I was really late to the party with that. You know, the only time I knew, I think I was just so, you know, knee deep in work that it that that yeah. whole thing just went past me and the only reason it actually i actually started paying a little bit more attention was because you guys went and sort of camped out there yeah and, and yeah that sort of like just create a little bit more awareness for me so just just refresh me on that a little bit more about that issue because that issue seems to have apparently has gone away is no longer an issue now or maybe oh no it's still going no no what i'm saying is like no one's reporting on it you know like, oh yeah so um I'm, so currently, I'm actually not quite sure what's currently the standing point. I have seen a few updates because they're still doing updates, but it's still an ongoing thing. Like it's definitely not over yet. So it's it's land dispute, right? Someone, a, a yeah. company wanted to build homes. Fletchers, yeah. Fletchers wanted to build apartments there, but then that land is actually sacred. It, it, yeah. Th there's something that's so significant to yeah. the Maori. Um, on that yeah. specific land. Okay, so they didn't yeah. want anyone to build on it. So that's where yeah, the issue came exactly. from. Yeah, yeah. Okay, got you. Now I understand. Now, now it's all starting to come back and make sense to me. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> My memory is so bad. Eh? Like Honor keeps telling me her memory is bad, but like now that I'm thinking about it, like far out, I kind of remember a lot from last week. I don't know. No, same deal. You're asking me these questions, and I'm like raking my brain to try and. Remember. I sent you. I sent you the. <laughs> I sent you the outline as well. Yeah. No, no these law about. questions. I'm like, oh, okay, law questions, back bro. to my law degree. Bro, it's the same same thing with nursing, man. Like, I had to relearn a lot of stuff when I when I finally got out into the field. Like all oh, yeah. the stuff I learned was like okay, maybe that's relevant, maybe that's not relevant to what I'm doing, but I felt like I had yeah. to relearn everything. Uh, I, I, guess think, it, I feel like that's everyone, because yeah. honestly, my, my law degree, they asked me, oh, what was that paper? I literally can't remember. So <laughs> yeah, as well, soon as the exam's done and I know I'm passed, I'm like, sweet, gone. Yeah, I delete everything, eh? Like, it's almost <laughs> like I have to start fresh. There's only a limited capacity left of memory in my brain, and I have to yeah. keep making space. <laughs> so no, I literally. <laughs> So, so it, now that we're sort of back into sort of uni life, do you think um were, were you prepared going into uni? I don't hear a lot of people talk about oh, you know, their um no. their first experiences stepping into being you know, yeah a uni student. Was yeah, that, was that a smooth transition for you? Um, no, I wouldn't say it was smooth. So I was, I mean, I was lucky in the sense that I grew up with a lot of cousins who came through my home who went to uni. So I saw them working hard and doing late nights but it never really made sense to me i was just like uh, they're just doing their thing you know yeah. but when i started uni i just was not prepared <laughs> for the how they wanted assignments done all the referencing and stuff like that i had no idea about and university of Auckland's so big like just going from class to class even the small things like um getting my courses, what courses I was doing this that year and what papers I had to do, I found it so confusing. So, yeah, it wasn't an easy tra transition, which is why I like, um, I worked for Unibound at University of Auckland and that helps Māori and Pacifica students with that transition. So yeah. I wish I went through something like that. So it's just someone like a guide, like a guide to yeah. help you sort of yeah. know what to do. Um, yeah where you could go seek help and stuff like that yeah yeah but also the small academic things like writing in an, an academic university level essay and stuff like that 
Yeah, we had heaps of that at Unitech too, but I was too stubborn. Eh? I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't need your help. I'm going to do this myself. <laughs> and, I, and this is my first year, you know, um, before I actually got into nursing, I was doing foundations and bro, yeah. bombed hard. Eh? I, think, I think that little support, especially at the very beginning, is quite crucial because yeah. your first year is kind of your make or break for a lot yeah. of things, right? Yeah. Because you sort of use your first year. I, I mean, this is from just my own personal experience as almost a marker of whether this is the place for you, you know, like do, mm. should you continue studying or are you going yeah. to enjoy this program? Because I tell you what, if you have a shit first year, you're going to find it very difficult to come back the next year. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. You know? And, you know, and especially with, you know, if, you know, keep talking about representation and, you know, trying to get more and more of, you know, Pacifica people into higher learning, you know, mm -hmm. they need, not not that they need, but I think it'll be helpful if they had, you know, if they were aware, and I'm hoping they are made aware of these kind of resources out there to help transition into uni life, because it's, yeah. it's like, you can't compare it to anything, right? Because if you've been in high school your whole life, no. it's literally like, you've been on, you know, you think things are difficult, right? You're sort of going through high school, because I did my last year of high school here. And, you, know, yeah. you think, oh, man, you know, like, I'm ready. I'm, you know, I know what, what life's about. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the cool guy. I know everything. And then you step into union, then you realize you ain't shit. No, literally. Like you, you are like, a, you, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's like you, they You're like the, the smallest fish in the exactly. biggest pond. Exactly. Especially Auckland Uni. You know, Auckland Uni is quite a big, big university. You know, not yeah. to mention it's right smack in the middle of our city. Yeah. You know? So just getting to there is a big issue in itself. You know, You're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> How are those train rides from South Auckland? All the Brad, way I to wish I knew about podcasts back at you because <laughs> they were like, honestly, the bus rides from, so there used to be a bus route that went straight from here to uni. Mm. They could be up to like an hour and a half, sometimes up to two hours because of traffic. Damn, two hours. Yeah, sometimes. And I'm coming from Mangere, but Bro, because the train, the we didn't really have a train, there was no oh, Onihanga right. Uni. Oh, was there? No, there was. No, it was there probably started. was. No, there was. But like, it, I didn't want to catch a bus, then a train, or catch yeah. a bus, then a Better So I caught that one, one bus. Yeah. So long. So if I had an 8 a.m. class, yeah, oh my God, can leave? I imagine? I, I think I had to catch sometimes like quarter to seven. <laughs> but at least, but at, least at least there's not a lot of traffic on at that time yeah that's why i didn't have to go the whole two hours if i go during school time like oh, the, yeah. the drop-offs man that's two when it's hours open. two hours god damn yeah what did you do with those two? i guess you got a lot of studying though i mean <laughs> not <laughs> really not. just I staring would try, out into but... space eh? <laughs> yeah and also the buses were so packed so it's not like i could bring out a book or a laptop like I used to just sit there with my music on and just, I don't know, waste time. It. Yeah. No, I, I used to take, I think when I first moved here, I had to take oh, a bus to, to school and it was, wasn't, it definitely wasn't two hours. It was probably like maybe 10, 15 minutes. But yeah, I, I just used to just dissociate, you know, just sit there on the bus and then like blink next thing I know I'm at school. I was like, oh crap, what the yeah. hell? Yeah, which I is know. helpful, <laughs> which is helpful when you're on a two hour bus ride to town and <laughs> you got yeah. time to kill. The best was when someone came on that I knew, and I was like, thank goodness I have someone to talk to. Bro, that's the best, yeah. Or else, you, or the worst part is you had the risk of, of someone that you didn't like coming on the bus. Oh, no, yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> no. Do I talk to them? Do I not talk to them? And then bus dramas happen, you know, and then someone posts, posts like, a like what, what's that gossip page at Auckland Uni that everyone loves writing about their issues and problems? Oh, you, oh, you don't know. I don't know. Nah, I don't know it. You don't know it? There's a no. page on Facebook, a, a Facebook group page where, oh, let me see if I can find it while I'm talking about it, where they talk and like, it's all anonymous and they complain about their, about whatever is happening on at uni. So. Oh, what the heck? I could have uh, used it. Not jokes. <laughs> Oakland University Confessions. UOA. Oh. Meaningful Confessions. You should have a look at it. It's hilarious. Like, people write ridiculous things. Like, a lot of it has been around COVID and sort of, like, you know, stuff being online. Um, yeah. Because <laughs> graduation's been cancelled, right? Like, I just got told that today. Um, I have it. Yeah, graduation's oh. been. So, like, the very first thing someone's wrote is, like, graduation? Who? 
damn, just thought when I finally graduated and walked that stage, guess not. It, it's just, <laughs> it's, so people write like paragraphs upon paragraphs about of things, confession. of confessions, like, it, and, it, and it's hilarious because like, it, it's, it's a great time waster because yeah. A, cause because it's anonymous, people don't, you know people are f go free, go free reign, and just say not whatever out. the hell they want. So it's not just complaints. There's actually confessions of love. People confess their love uh -huh. about someone, you know, and then and then it's funny because the comments start going rampant. It's like, who is this person talking about? Because they'll explain and say, you know, we take this class together, you know, we do this together. Um, you yeah. don't notice me, but I'm always there. Blah blah. blah. It's kind of creepy as well. Yeah, that's you know, creepy. Like, like I was a, just about to say. Like I notice you, but you don't notice me. You know, <laughs> but it, but it's hilarious. You should definitely jump on it, man. You might. Yeah, you might, you might. Some of your friends. I might find something yeah. about me. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. So it's the UOA meaningful confessions. Oh, what a shout out to UOA meaningful confessions. Whoever started this page, is a genius. Yeah. Because at the moment, just looking at the number, because I guess they put the number. Yeah, they do. The number of uh, posts that they've done. So out of each post, they'll post what number that is. Yeah. 2,934 is the latest Holy one. Holy <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Oh, there you go. So, oh, you can also chat anonymously. They've got a Discord page. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's, Gee, it's hilarious. that's a whole thing. It's, it's hilarious. How did you not know about this? You I don't know. I just confessions? Never you're like on social media like all the time how do you not yeah, know I, this? I had no idea i just never heard of it i i, I hopefully have may not i hope i haven't sort of just created like an extra thing for you to procrastinate on but yeah it, yeah it's it, it is hilarious it is great reading material how this is not a magazine i have no idea you don't know <laughs> but it, it may be but but actually this is probably more environmentally friendly but it is yeah. one of the greatest pages that's related to Oakland Uni ever. And I can say that because I went to Oakland Uni for uh, one year and that sucked. Postgrad. <laughs> Postgrad sucked so bad. Sorry, Gio. Yeah. yeah. It sucked. I, I hate I don't studying. think I ever want to do postgrad. I had to. Mental health, because it's specialized in nursing, you have to do a postgrad. Oh, so okay. It's like I, I had no choice. It's like, you want to work in this field, you got to do postgrad. I was like, yeah. oh, man. Damn it. Can I change? Can I go general? Can I just be a general nurse now? <laughs> So, okay, so just moving on. You've been involved with a couple of uh, different organizations over the years. Um, yeah. More, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about your time with the, is it Edmund Rice camps? Oh, yeah, that's, oh, that has my heart. Of course, I'll talk about Edmund Rice yeah. camps. <laughs> yeah, please do. Can you explain a little bit about what they do and then sort of what your involvement has been with them? Yeah, so Edmund Rice camps is a um, one-week camp program for children who um, have some, le oh, yeah, have some level of disadvantage in their lives, maybe because of financial, social, family reasons, and those children get referred to us usually by social workers, um, and we just give them a week break. So we try and create a culturally rich environment for them to grow in confidence and um, just get, have their, give them a break and also their families a break. Um, just as a restarter and a refresh. And then we have a one-to-one -one program. So we have um, every one kid has a leader just so that we ensure that every kid has um, a, a lot of attention that week and a lot of confidence boosting and stuff like that. So a lot of growth. That's cool. So how many people do you guys usually take like per year? Um, okay. So we run four camps throughout the year. We have two summer camps one well what is the next season autumn and one winter <laughs> okay you guys do seasonal yeah it's the school holidays oh school holidays all oh, right yeah that so makes it's sense. Two holidays one in term one holidays and one in term two holidays oh, that's yeah cool. so what do you guys yeah. so so obviously you guys go go camping like what do you guys do during this doing this camp i mean aside, oh, aside so, from yeah. having a great time yeah you know do you guys so, sort of work on I mean, I mean, do they? I mean, okay, I'll let you explain. What What do you guys usually do on the camp? Okay, so our program is usually we do it in Mutawai at a, a a campsite there, and we usually put them in teams. They obviously the one to one ratio, and we do a lot of team building on the first day, just so that the teams are strong. And then from there, we do a lot of um, confidence building activities, so activity based learning, um, where 
I don't know, there's just um, activities that help them um, learn to grow as a team and an individual. And then we usually have a day out. So we'll take them to the pools as something exciting on my last camp. I we thought you, I thought say, we take them out to the bar. I was like, what kind of camp is this? Not the best <laughs> camp. Take them to the bar. I'm only 12. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> the pools. The pools. Um, Sorry. Um, the the last camp we fundraised really hard, and we were able to take them to Rainbow's Inn because we knew oh, coming out of lockdown, it was a it was a hard time for a mm. lot of people, and especially the kids who were coming on camp, it would have been a really hard time for them. So we wanted to make it extra special, and we took them to Rainbow's Inn. So we do activities, we do a talent show, so they can come out of their shells. Um, we do there's just a whole lot of fun stuff it's just a lot of playing and chanting mm. and it's just a lot of fun I, I, that's the only way i can explain it so they get referred to through uh, tamika kioranga nah, social oranga, worker. Oranga, just just any social worker yeah yeah so we have a few social workers that we call on quite often mm. and then we have a leader on camp who actually works at a boys home so he brings in boys from the boys home um but yeah we have relationships or social workers that we um, bring kids on from how, how difficult is that because working with youth for one thing is has its own complications and difficulties. Yeah. But to work with youths who grow up in difficult life circumstances is another one. Yeah. How how do you guys approach those kind of children who come through very difficult upbringings and, and broken homes? Yeah. So we have training the four camps. Um, just to go through a few scenarios, but I'm not going to lie, it is really hard, especially um, when kids open up to you and you do get an insight into what's going on at home. Mm. Um, because it's only a week, we don't carry on contact with them afterwards. It's literally just that one week refresher. That's a hard, that's so hard. Yeah, so yeah. it's a hard let go, and like um, we go through a lot of reflections through the week with our leaders to ensure that they're prepared and um, they're growing as the week progresses. Progresses, sorry. Um, but yeah, it is really hard. And sometimes when things do come up, we have a whole system, a child protection system that we go through. If something does come up, and we're alerted by it. So we do have systems and policies in place for when things do come through that are really serious. Um, but in saying that, it's really fulfilling because you see how happy the kids are at the end of the week, and um, a massive change in them. So a lot of them come on really quiet, shy, embarrassed to do anything, and they just leave with a whole new sense of happiness from that one week and growth. And so yeah, it's a, it's really special. And as you said, it is really hard. But yeah, it's work I'm really really passionate about. I mean, I've been with them for eight years. So wow, I didn't <laughs> yeah. realize you were with them for that long. I mean. Yeah, definitely. I, I I definitely get what you mean when you talk about uh, feeling fulfilled and and just how amazing it is to sort of help others and mm. especially you know one of the more vulnerable groups in our in our population, which which is the yeah. youth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I can't. I, I I find it very difficult to work with with children, mostly yeah. because I don't think I can keep my emotions in check when working with children. I once, mm. I remember working as a HCA. This is probably like when it clicked to me where I was like, damn, I, I really need to check myself for a lot of, you know, I was, uh, I think I was in Middlemore. I got called over to do a watch because I was one of the only males in my company and one of the bigger ones. I get to do the really sort of hard, difficult watches where I just sit with a patient, you know, for a shift and sort of just help them, you know, with their needs. And I got yeah. called in to ED in middle yeah. where I had to sit with a young child who was unfortunately uh, a victim of domestic violence and had quite a lot of serious injuries to him. So my job was actually to sort of make sure the parents and the parents were actually trying to discharge him and take him out and, and, and remove him from the hospital before his treatment was done. Right. So my job was to sort of sit there and make sure, well, I don't know how legal this was, but my directive was to sort of make sure that the parents didn't take the child. Actually, yeah. there may have been some legal issues there because I think the social work, uh, uh, Oranga Tamariki was involved and and there was the social work and stuff there. But what made me sort of click was I saw the, the parents come in and I just got this overwhelming feeling of I'm just going to 
the these parents right now because right, it, yeah. it, it wasn't like a, a, a you know they're denying it like they sort of you know they we, they knew who who beat this child and they knew that this was you know serious serious violence to someone young and yeah you know and it's sort of like when it comes to children it's very difficult you know and and you know there's a lot of people that sort of you know, have similar experiences where it's hard to maintain professional boundaries when it comes to children. And I mean that in like, if, especially if you come across children who are sort of harmed or children who are, you know, um, you, you know, you know, in, in very, you know, serious sort of danger when they're with their parents and, you know, to work with that kind of group of, of people is, is a very difficult and, and hard and very emotionally taxing sort of field. And, yeah. Yes, yeah, that's why I commend you. I commend you working with these, with these, with these people because they need that support. You know, they need someone that they know is out there that cares about them and is willing to give yeah. their time um, to sort of spend, even if it's just a week. You know, it's unfortunate yeah. that it's only a week and you know there's no contact after. I mean, I'm sure there's for good reasons. You know, um, yeah. but you know, it, it just goes to show that that there there's a desperate need out there for more supports especially for yeah. our, for for our the, you know the younger generation out there who may yeah. feel alone you know may feel mm. that there's no hope or no help out there for them yeah. Yeah, especially now during lockdown you know now you know it's you know when i think of lockdown one of the biggest things that that sort of came to me was you know people go to school sometimes to escape what's happening at home yeah you know? yeah um and now that that's no longer an option you know now we have you know people who you know i'm I'm not sure whether uh, i think it did did the number of domestic violence cases increase during the last lockdown i think it did i'm not sure I sorry think, yeah. i think it did no i think it did um and you know so it stands it's, to, it's, it stands a, it's a, a really sad reality it's a really yeah. sad reality and I think these camps also are an eye opener to a lot of our leaders of what we what is still very prevalent in New Zealand society because it can be forgotten by a lot of us that like you know with our lives a lot of us are really privileged so it's a it's amazing work and eye opener to uh, mm. to a lot of our leaders. Yeah. So how did you get involved with them initially? I mean, eight years is a long time. So yeah, I know. School? Yeah, it was my last year of high school. I had an ex Baradine girl message me, and she was like, hey, I'm camp captaining a camp. Um, we do work with kids. Can you come on? Basically, that's it. I had no idea what it was about. I had no idea what I was getting into. And I was just like, yeah, sure. I came on and, like, basically cried every night because, oh, yeah. as you are saying, it's so emotionally taxing, like, just seeing how happy and beautiful they are, but mm -hmm. knowing their backgrounds, it's really difficult to... Mm -hmm. um, to, to grapple that and so yeah I've really found my first camp really difficult but um, I've stayed on for eight years because I've seen the work it does mm. and um, yeah I just can't let it go not just yet <laughs> I mean that that speaks volumes in itself you know obviously there's a lot of organizations out there that sort of present themselves as being you know they were there to help the vulnerable blah 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 but mm. then you go work in these places and you're like they're not really they're actually, yeah. uh, you know, so obviously yeah. you staying on for that long and knowing you, you know, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't stay on if it wasn't doing anything, you know, positive, yeah, but they must be doing <laughs> such amazing work. What, why is it that we don't hear about them as much or, you or... know, actually that's something I've been, I've been talking about with a few of the more experienced leaders. It's, it's actually surprising to me that Edmund Rice camps isn't more well known. I think a lot of it has to do with we don't post the kids online just so that the families don't feel uncomfortable because of how we explain camps and the reason for them. So yeah, we don't post it we don't post them online and stuff like that. So I don't know. Um I feel like it's getting out to the communities it needs to get out to. So that's what's that's most important. Yeah. I guess how would you advertise that? I guess is the other thing, right? Is like yeah, it's oh, really difficult. we have a camp yeah. for is your child experiencing domestic violence at home? Yeah. Send them to our camp. Yeah. I mean, how, <laughs> you know, how, how do you, how do you advertise that? I, I mean, uh, yeah. I guess maybe word of mouth and sort of reaching out to the organizations that deal with children in that sort of space yeah. would be more helpful because 
you know, I guess. And there's a lot of processes we have to go yeah, through. So I can imagine we have to go through social workers, and we have to get forms done and behavioral forms and stuff like that. Yeah, the vulnerable because children's the people... act and all that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of there's so much pro so many processes we need to go through just to make sure everything's safe and legal, mm -hmm. and the kids are safe and stuff like that. And then yeah, so it's a whole big thing. So yeah, I just I don't you know so I sometimes think why. I sometimes wish more people knew about Edmund Rice, and then again, it's mm. maybe a blessing that they don't. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You know, thinking about it, it, it probably is because privacy is quite a big thing, especially when it yeah. comes to children. Yeah, um, 100%. And maybe that's a, that's one of the reasons they, they may not advertise. They probably are. They're probably not advertising the way that we probably think of what advertising is, you know, like, mm. like how McDonald's advertises their, you know, double Big Mac you know on yeah. tv you get blasted yeah. in the face but i think because this is a more sensitive more I'm super sensitive yeah, yeah i think there's there's less I, I don't think you that there's a, probably a certain way of sort of putting it out there and i do think it's through word of mouth and through your own connections where you where maybe the people who, yeah. who manage the whole camp it, are yeah. in constant conversations with dhbs with ngos you know and constant, other ngos that is yeah, mm. it's connections made over time. Definitely. Yeah, and I think that's probably one of the ways that because obviously running for eight years, they must be doing well. You know, how long have they been yeah. in, in business for? Um, so the camp that I just did, that was the seventieth camp. Wow, so it's been a long time. It's been a really long time. Yeah. And how many camps per year again? Is it like four? Four. Four camps four per camps year. Three. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty good. That's yeah. really really good. Oh, been goodness. running for a long time yeah yeah and and you guys should be you know you should be highly recommended for it and you have been if you know what oh. i mean so not to sort of you know not not to sort of burst you not know to toot my own horn. not to toot your own horn but you did receive the prime minister's pacific youth award um last year yeah i Was did it last year Congratulations. Yeah. I don't think I actually Thank congratulated you. you on that. How stupid of me. Or maybe I have. Maybe no, I have. You did. I'm, sure you I have. Did. I'm sure I did. God. Yeah. I... But yeah, so talk tell me a little bit about that because that um you got to meet um the Prime Minister and you and yeah, I mean, the, the article speaking. that they wrote about you was, was quite a good one because you talked a lot about who your influences are and why you sort of are the way that you are. Do you mind just right. talking a little bit about sort of that and and sort of why you sort of continue to give. Yeah, sure. So yeah, as you said, I got the Prime Minister's Award Community Stars, the one I got it in. So mm -hmm. um, it's all the work I've been doing within my community. And honestly, it still feels like a dream to me. I actually just still can't believe that that happened. What, um, that you met the Prime Minister or did you? Yeah, and, then, and then I even and got, got the, the award. Prime award. Like, I see it on my CV and I'm like, what a fraud. I'm not kidding. No, it's that but imposter it, syndrome. It's, but yeah, I think it was well it's deserved. Imposter syndrome. It definitely is. But um, touching on what you were saying before, it, it, it's almost second nature to me, the work that I'm doing within my community. And the reason why I say that is because. Um, are you talking about my mum? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, Who else okay. would I be talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Lil Mama. So Lil Mama. Grow, yeah, Lil Mama. So growing up, my mum. So our family home literally is the family home mm -hmm. in, or has become the family home in Auckland. And growing up, I've had so many cousins come through and um, a lot of family come through. And it never was, my mum never questioned it. She was just like, welcome, come home. And it, it was home for them. It never was a place to stay or accommodation or they're renting here or anything. It was home. And I think seeing that and watching my mum just give Sometimes when she wasn't in the position to give, mm. um, it just became second nature to me to to want to give in that way as well. So, um, yeah, so it's it's natural to me now to want to give back to my community. Watching, and it's not just my mum. Like a lot of the women in our family, including your mum, Gio, mm. they just are so welcoming, so hospitable, and love so much, even when they might not have the capacity to do so. Mm. So I think growing up and watching that has just made it second nature to a lot of us in our family, not just me. It's something that that I sort of not personally struggle with. I, I do as well. But it's also something that I noticed that is sort of a, a dying breed in a way. 
it's giving mm. with no expectation of having anything returned, anything right? Return. Yeah. These days when you see people, you know, do things, there's always like, it's like a transaction, right? I'll do something for you. You do something yeah. for me yeah. or I'll do this for you now. Maybe sometime down the line, you can do a favor for me. People yeah. like your mom. And, and I know this obviously because she's my auntie and I've sort of known her all my life. Yeah. She's definitely sits in that realm of giving wholeheartedly without an yeah. expectation of having anything returned. And yeah. that is a difficult, it, it's almost saintly. Don't tell her I said that, you know, <laughs> but, but her head, her her head, head will explode. explode. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah but 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 like it but it's true though right i mean i mean it, yeah. it's quite evident in in all the people that's that's come into contact with her i mean who hasn't lived in your house really? literally who hasn't who hasn't i think i, got I, mean, close I didn't to... have a bedroom for so long Bro, i think i was close so to i think i was here. close to living with you guys at one point but like yeah. you know it's like exactly that right and it's and it's a skill I don't know if it's a skill or something or, or whether it's based on values or something innate within, you know, spirituality or whatever, yeah. religious, whatever, you know, but it, it's, it's one of those things that I, I, I definitely agree with you is that it's, it's been a very positive influence, you know, for everyone, you know, everyone yeah. she's come to contact and, and I'm sure all the people who's ever lived in your house can attest to that as well, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's, and the list is long. And the list is really long. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. The list, is, the list long. is really long. But I mean, it's been a blessing on me. Like, mm -hmm. I'm for a long time, uh, for nine years, I was an only child. So I I grew up with people around me all the time. So I was really lucky. You, you I was really lucky. Yeah. You, you weren't really an only child, though. You were, I mean, like back during those years, before everyone did the massive migration to New Zealand, I mean, to, to Australia, right? There was yeah. like so much of us here. No, I had out. So I, I was just lucky. We just had family around all the time. So I got catfished. I got catfished. I When I moved here, it was under the assumption that Stan, Mark, all of those guys would oh, still be here. Really? So when I came here, it totally didn't you know, click that they had already moved to Australia. So yeah. I got the shit end of the deal when I moved here. <laughs> You I had no one. No, actually, I had Shane. That, that's 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 oh, that's not true. I had Shane, and Shane yeah, had Shane me. And Jeffrey. Yeah, Shane and Jeffrey, bro. <laughs> yeah, I spent I spent I think all my weekends at Shane's house. But yeah, but it's like um, it it's a difficult one. Like I don't know, I don't know if I should say that it's 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 becoming less and less common. But I don't see it as much the way that yeah. sort of, especially um, the way that is that we've been growing yeah, up. Is, is that is that being able to serve? Right? Is that uh, it's, being able it's to like serve. with Nana, even our Nana. Yeah. So she always got things and then she just gave it away. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. she just, she just never, it was just never a second thought. If she mm. saw someone who needed more than her, then she just gave it. Right. And for the, and like it came back in blessings, I feel. Oh, absolutely. In, a, in our own tongue and karma sort of way. Of yeah, course it did. Of course it did. You know, um, yeah. and you can tell, you know, when she passed away, um, how much she was oh, appreciated yeah. in the community, you know, yeah. I mean, the amount of people that showed up, the amount of stories that we heard, you know, even the terrible ones, you know, the fights that they heard Malia Sosefo <laughs> used to get into, you know, even those ones, yeah. you know, um, we, we, I feel like, do, do you think as the generations move on, you know, your generation, my generation start to grow up and then the next generation, like my children, do you yeah. think we're starting to lose that sort of um, mentality where we find, where we find meaning in being able to serve others, not as slaves, but being willing to serve other people um, the way that your mom did, like for your family and for other people? Yeah. Um, I find that kind of, yeah, that is a difficult question to answer, but I think, like, we were so lucky that we've seen it, that it's just become normal to me to do so, but also, growing up in New Zealand, where things are run super differently to how they are back in the islands, I think already that's one way that we're starting to lose it, just because everyone's focusing on their own journey, their own career, their, you know, so it's... It depends on the individual. It depends on their upbringing. But I don't know. I feel like it could be 
in some sense, in some ways, and then in other ways, it's not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my hope is that we find like a marriage between the two, right? Because we obviously live, we don't live in Tonga, we don't live in in the yeah. islands. We're actually yeah. living in a westernized society, and yeah. we have to find some way to marry our Pacifica values to the way that yeah. we're living now. Because there are people who Pacifica people who grow up here. And relate more to the Western society than they do to yeah. um, the Pacifica worldview, which is fine. You know, yeah, it doesn't make them less Pacifica. They're just a, yeah. you know, they're just a different brand. You know, yeah, um, yeah. You know, so hopefully we are able to find, and I think we are. I think, Good point. I think we are That's able to. Way. Yeah. So, sorry, what was that? I think we're finding ways to. Yeah, I think so too, and and I think we'll, we'll continue to sort of evolve. I mean, like. You know, a language is one of those things that, you know, I'm hoping will continue to sort of grow and we, we tend to retain it more. Like, I'm terrible at the language. I've mentioned this before, which is such an odd thing because I grew up in Tonga. Mm, I'm blaming mm. colonization on that one. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anything wrong in my life, I'm just blaming colonization. Yeah. Colonization. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't pass my math exam. It's colonization. colonization. It's like, this is baloney <laughs> maths. Like... Grab me some sticks and stones. I'll show you some island and maths. <laughs> Fucking sticks hell. and stones, yeah. bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So, listen, I want to talk to you also. I left this last because um, I've, been, I've been enjoying your content ever since you began it. Um, I wasn't, I didn't follow it from the very beginning. and But when I sort of caught on to it, I actually watched the majority of your videos and that's your, your vlogs that you've been posting oh, up on social cool. media and, uh, and on youtube yeah you are ridiculously entertaining oh you know thanks <laughs> it, it's just uh, it, it's definitely not because i know you i think just yeah. the energy that you bring and just how you find everything hilarious even though it's not yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just so good what got you into vlogging because I'll ask you that first, and then I'll and I'll sort of move on to to something else I wanted to ask you. But how did you get into vlogging first? Okay, so I mean, me growing up, it was like the thing to watch YouTube, you know. Of course. So I watched is. a lot. Of, yeah, hundred percent. So I watched a lot of YouTube, but I was like, man, there are no Islanders, or what? There was no one I could really relate to. Mm. Like a lot of YouTubers had real lavish lifestyles. They were doing yeah. hauls of the most expensive things. So I was just like, yeah, it's really cool and fun to watch and they're going on cool holidays, but I just couldn't relate. Exactly. And then I and then it just became I just thought, man, I'll just make my own, you know? Mm. So so I for a long time I actually put it off. So I made one video in high school um, with my little sister. And then I didn't make another one until the first MMT game. Right. Yeah, yeah. So um I, and that was a personal thing. I found it really because you know you're putting your whole self out there. I'm I'm sure it's the same with you and your podcast. Just putting just yourself video. out there, is a difficult <laughs> thing to do. And like just with my vlogs, like it's not just me; it's my whole family on there. So it was a big decision for me to make. But I just thought I really enjoy doing it. I like recording things. I like putting them together. Um, and so I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to do it. And then I did the MMT video, and it just went a little bit crazy. Um, <laughs> I wonder and why. And I wasn't expecting it. Yeah. But I was like, okay, anything, honestly, you post anything MMT, and it's going to go viral. But um, ever since then, I think now I've gotten to a point where I continue to do YouTube, not just because I enjoy doing it, but because I love the representation that it brings to the YouTube community. And I know that... Um, there are a lot of kids who are probably going through the same struggle I had, not mm. being able to relate to anyone. So I just thought, I'm just going to continue to do this as my small part of helping that representation and sharing my journey and showing other people um, how I got there. And, you know, I get a lot of questions. I've had a few questions about pe from people who said, oh, how'd you get into law school and stuff like that. So it's a cool way to reach out and show that it's possible. And I'm always open to answering any messages or any comments. So, yeah, it's become a cool community. Even You're hoping to inspire others, basically. Well, I mean... Even if that's not the intention. Yeah, I think, it's not I think, I think it, it definitely is. Because you're right, in terms of... Uh, this seems to be the topic of, of, of the podcast, but representation, right? Yeah. You're right. There's a lot of bloody YouTubers out there that live, whether it's real or not, you know, they 
they make you they give you the perception they're living amazing lives you know yeah. for car yeah. garage pools mansions blah 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 yeah but like where's the islanders right and it's, not, it's just it's not healthy as well, well. It's, it's unrealistic a lot of yeah it. i mean yeah the, i mean probably they got there but they are like the 0.1 percent of people that make it on youtube right youtube is one of those yeah. things that's ridiculously so hard to break into and you need to yeah. be either amazing or you pay you you you, you luck yeah they're yeah. amazing or amazing luck of, of, of how yeah. you sort of make your videos but you know it's it's interesting because you were the only vlogger you and Isor were the only people i knew were vlogging um, maybe because you guys just popped up on my feed or you shared one of his videos and then I sort of followed it from there. But like, yeah. once I got into sort of like following you, watching you saw stuff, I realized there is a piss ton of Islanders that are doing. Yeah, There's so a big cool. community. There is a yeah. massive community recent, of people yeah. doing it. Yeah, in recent years, especially when the mukbanging started. That's so our thing. Mukbangers. That is our I'm thing, man. That. Yeah, yeah and could, they're like, really good at it. <laughs> bro, Islanders can mukbang the shit out of anything. They would. That, that, is, that is our. We should be claiming that. That should be yeah, our thing. We've been doing it since forever, and I've got bollocks. Now, so we, just need a, now we just need a camera, you know? Yeah. yeah. Being but quiet is hard, bro. But yeah, there's yeah. an amazing there's amazing group of, of, of you guys, and yeah. it, it seems to have exploded. What, what What's the appeal, do you think? What's what's the appeal of, of people recording themselves and. and posting it up for others to see um well i i touched on my motivations but i feel mm. like a lot of people just enjoy watching how other people live to True. be honest yeah so i think that's part of it like they see one person doing it and they're like wow that's really cool i want to do it too so i think that's one of the reasons mm. and of course there's people like you saw who have a passion for film and media and photography and stuff like that mm. so yeah, I'm not. Quite, I can't speak for everyone, but I'm assuming that's why. But we have there is a big community now, and it's called um, PolyTube. Mm. So we have there's a PolyTube community, and it is crazy how many uh, bus speaker YouTubers there. Are now. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I follow PolyTube on Instagram. Uh, Harriet yeah. started that. Was it Harriet? Yeah, it was Harriet. Yeah. Hello, Harriet. Yeah. yeah. So I followed. I think did I follow her? I followed. Well, I followed one of them like first, and then was it? It wasn't. It was last year, wasn't it? You guys had that big get together. Was it last year? Yeah, I missed that one, but yeah, yeah they. they missed yeah, it. it was the second one. That, I went to the first one. That's what really sort of just put into perspective for me. It's like, what the heck? Look at all these. Look at all these creators. So many of them, yeah. It's so awesome, but but you know what? What I really enjoy about vlogging, some some vloggers I fucking hate. Like I just find them oh, really? so frustrating. I'm not gonna name yeah. them. That's for a different podcast. But, yeah. <laughs> but vloggers I hate. Um, but there are <laughs> there 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 are some that I find ridiculously good because they actually introduce our culture in in a light mm -hmm. that is our own narrative. It's controlled yeah. by the Basfika people. Yeah, and. There's no, and, and that to me is like I can sense the authenticity in it all. Like it's not yeah. forced, it's not sort of staged. It's just, you know, this family yeah. who goes out, they do their day to day life. This is what it looks like raw. Yeah. You know, maybe there's a little bit yeah. of editing in there to cut out the swearing and, and, yeah. and all that other stuff. But, you know, this is what it looks like. And it's so, and it totally goes against the preconceptions of what a Basifika family is and what Basifika like, people yeah. do. Yeah, the perception is is that we're all sort of just hanging around, being bums on the benefit. Yeah, uh, this totally flips that on its head. So I really, uh, I'm I'm hoping more people do it. You know, people like you and and people like you saw to continue doing things because you saw is doing great things at the moment. He's doing such amazing things for health Hard. at the Hard moment, out. mental health and physical health and physical health. You know? Yeah. His his journey um for weight loss is so ridiculously inspiring. Even if he doesn't think it is. I know he is. It's I know super he knows. Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculously <laughs> inspiring, you know. Um, yeah. And just his little updates, you know, about what he's doing and, and what he's thinking and feeling are also things that Pacifica people aren't very good at doing, talking about feelings mm -hmm. and talking mm -hmm. about their their own thoughts and oh, yeah. opinions on things. Yeah. yeah. So vlogs are a very good way of, of doing that. Um, and, and, I'm, and, and, I'm, and I'm hoping it continues to grow. Yeah, and that's another really important thing is that our stories are 
are shown and told by our people, which mm. is another reason why I do it because more often than not, our stories are told by mainstream media or something. It's filtered down to something that it's not or it's a bad representation of us. So I just think it's so important that, as I said, our stories are told by our own people, which is it's another reason why I showed my cover ceremony and then mm. I got our Uncle Bila to explain throughout because I just thought, you know, a lot of times people in our generation, they think things like that are a waste of, t a waste of time. Mm. And I'm the same. Like, sometimes I hear it and I'm like, oh, what's the point? But when you look into it, you know, I... Uh, when I look, when I when Bila was explaining to me, I was like, "Wow, this is really beautiful," you know. <laughs> I was like, "Why, why do we have this perception of uh, of certain things in our culture, but when it comes down to it, we don't actually know." Because we're not but, asking, you know, we're not yeah, asking. We kind yeah. of just and, and and I'm guilty of that wholeheartedly. Um, our last couple of putus that we've been to, like that's pretty evident of that, right? It's like none of the people who usually speak for us were here yeah and now myself you laura alice you know we were like left to do the you know the the coven and we're like what the fuck do we do you know? yeah. And, and, that's yeah, because, and it's not like we haven't been to a funeral before right we've been to heaps heaps of funerals we just never we never asked how things work right? yeah we never asked like why do they do this why do they do that you know who, who is that person speaking why is that significant yeah. Um, and I had this conversation with Saul. It's like my one of my biggest fear um, is that we're going to lose that knowledge because we're not interested in it. And, and I yeah. don't think we're not interested in it when we're young, right? We're yeah. more interested in it in our later years, in like our mid-20s, when we start yeah. to understand the value of our own culture, the value of sort of our upbringing and, and the yeah. knowledge of our elders. We do start to value that in our later years. But like yeah. we still don't ask. You know, so that's sort of something that I'm going to try. Lucky Hon is doing Tongan studies and all these. Yeah, things. I know. That's cool. I was just going to say <laughs> that. She's Hon going is to holding be my it down gateway. for both of you. Bro, yes, she is. She's holding it down for, for this whole household, actually. But, like, <laughs> but yeah, so, like, my my goal soon, like, you know, once I get my shit together is actually to try and, do in my own time, like, read up on our histories and sort of, like, you know, our, our traditions and things like that because, Listen, at, at some point, right, we are the ones that are going to have to try and sort of present that knowledge and carry it on yep. and, and try and explain it, explain it in, in our own way. Yeah. And, you know, we have access, you know, to people who know so much about it. You know, like I think of like our um, our relatives back in Tonga, like um, Barcelona and all of them who actually know, you know, all of these, you know, protocols. And, and that's yeah. what it is. It's protocols, you know? Yeah. Um, and the reasons why we have those protocols. Um, so that, that's and sort of... And the thing is beautiful. We just haven't cared enough to... It absolutely is. It, you know? And, yeah. and, and it's not that... I don't think we didn't... It, it's not that we don't care. I think it's more that we just we didn't... didn't we, we, we didn't understand um, how much it's a part of us, really. Yeah. How much that, you know? How much True. a part True. of it. Yeah, that's how to put it. Because yeah, I, like I mean, look, listen, as children, we don't really give a shit about anything but what we think is cool at the time, right? Yeah. And going to a yeah. funeral is not cool, you know. Sitting there for hours while someone slaps a pig is not cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. That that's that's an inside joke for my family. But anyways, yeah. you know, <laughs> slapping the pig. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, I miss that dude. I. Eh? Oh. Yes. <laughs> but like but you know that's that's something that hopefully you know i'm going to try in my own way to remedy and, and hopefully that will influence my children to sort of find that interesting too i mean summer is now like my youngest one is starting to do taolungas now so she's starting yeah! to do that oh, a lot love it. Love so it. that that's something i'm really happy with and that's being driven by by her mom and, and by her auntie as well um, yeah so i'm really grateful for that you know, so that that's the kind of stuff that I hope, you know, that we can start. We'll be on the journey with. together, Gio. Yeah. Oh, yes. We'll grab, grab Yoey and Frankie and all of them. We'll all jump on the yeah. same bus because we're yeah. in desperate need of education in this round. This dotty, dotty, dotty. Dotty. Oh, my God. <laughs> if anything, that that's a, that's a prime example. She can be in the front of the bus. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. All of us were together. Those plastic those tumblers. Those tumblers eh? Of our tonic culture. <laughs> yes. That that's a show in itself. Discover it's like roots. Roots but for Tongans. You know? Yeah. Literally. That would be, be epic. Oh man. So not only do you guys do you do vlogs, but you guys have also started a podcast. You and two of your other friends. Untouched yeah. Places. Man, you guys that man you guys just keep just showing up with with new and impressive skills eh? your your episodes oh, that you guys you. have released so far has been really good a really good insight actually into what life is like for you know pacifica women or pacifica girls growing up here in new zealand and yeah i'll tell you what it's very different to growing up in tonga <laughs> oh yeah when i was listening to your episode with yoey i was like what were you guys up to <laughs> <laughs> we were up to no good that's what it was it's totally different oh, totally it's, different. it's it's really it it is but like it's interesting hearing it from this side because a lot of the times people always reflect on what you know uh, and i had this conversation a while back with with honey you know yeah. what is um a tongan like what how do you classify yeah. and how do you identify a tongan you know yeah. and and you know a lot of it is culture right yeah. it's cultural values and all these other things um so how do you you know but for a long time we used to identify people who came from tonga those were real tongans the tongans who grew up here weren't real like that that was what the perspective was right so god i'm kind of lost my train of thought there no so so sort of listening to sorry this is where i'm going far out so listening okay. to you and your friends um talk about your experiences in new zealand um was quite eye-opening because although yes different environment but a lot of similarities at the same time same sort of issues at school same sort of barriers that we found you know um same dramas that yep. happened you know so how did you guys um decide to start a podcast oh uh, it was honestly it came out of procrastination studying for exams oh, no. <laughs> not one of those ones so we studied together a lot on the lead up to exams um we were taking papers together and then um, Tauta and Emma, the other two that I'm on the podcast with, were really into podcasts at that time. And they're like, yeah, like, why don't we just start one? And then I was, <laughs> honestly, I was the one who was the most like, are you guys serious? You know? Skeptical. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I was, I was the most skeptical. I was just like, are you guys all right? Not kidding. And then the more they talked about it, the more I was like, whoa. And so Tauta got me into listening to a few podcasts that she was listening to at that time mm -hmm. and i was thinking what an amazing like platform that um that that we could use to share stories that we have been sharing and as you mm -hmm. said it's about our first season is about growing up in south auckland as um pacifica young woman mm -hmm. but um what's come of that in starting this podcast has been so cool to see so many other plus speaker podcasts again mm. podcasters i had no idea like you with the youtube i was just like what i didn't i had no idea there was this huge community right. and it's mostly through you that i found a lot of other plus speaker podcasters yeah uh, they were hard to find though like when i started oh, really at the beginning like a big very similar to why you started vlogging I was really into podcasts for you know a couple of years now, where I listened to yeah. Joe Rogan, just the usual ones. A lot of ones yeah. around, around pol political podcasts, you know, talk about politics yeah. and left and right, blah blah blah, what have you. And yeah. w it just dawned on me one time I was like, man, I'm, I'd really like to hear, you know, a Pacifica point of view, like like right. like, like a discussion of what what Pacific people think and how that's going to impact pacific people you know yeah um and there was listen there's, there's quite a few in the states um there's a lot in the states actually of, of podcasts oh, okay. that's bringing up but not a lot here in new zealand yeah um yeah I've for, from, from when i first started so aside from you myself there is back of the 135 which i always yep. brown nose in all of my episodes because i really do enjoy listening to their stuff yeah um there's uh yash and he's he runs zealous state of mind um oh there's there's a few the the, the back of the 135 have recently started their own network so they've got a lot of stuff there so there's a plug for them oh, cool. so west west net the west west net dot com you know they, oh no yeah i've seen that they yeah, have yeah yeah amazing stuff going on there at the moment but they were you know before they started that they were the them 
you know, um, Zell State of Mind, yours and mine, I think at the time were the only Buzzfeeker New Zealand based podcasts and podcasters yeah. that I knew. Yeah. Um, and yeah, since then, I, there seems to be a couple more springing up here and there. And it's great. You know, it's great to hear specifically our views for here. Like, yeah. I enjoy American ones. Like, um, Village Made Podcast is another one. And they, you know, he has very interesting guests come on. But that's all American, Hawaii um, right. sort of uh, worldview. Well, not worldview. Perspective. Uh, like perspective, right? It's very yeah. different to what we are doing here. So when I talk with people, I try and keep it local to New Zealand. Because our issues are, are very different, right? There may be some similarities yeah. with, with America and Australia. Um, probably more of Australia, but still New Zealand has very unique issues to themselves and those are the ones I find more interesting because they impact me the most stuff yeah, like politics yeah. and all that stuff so so yeah I mean, I mean podcasting is one of those spaces where like hey like Islanders doing podcasts like what does that mean you know like you just sit yeah down and, and talk it's like yeah it's what we do best you literally know? it's literally I mean, what it's, we do it's best like, it's the basis of our culture is we are orators and exactly. our history was passed down orally so it's so natural to us exactly. so i don't know why we haven't why we didn't jump on earlier but it's cool that we're here now it's, it's cool really we're cool. here now and and sort of making inroads for others to sort of see and i guess it's the same yeah. as vlogging right you know you just need to see other people doing it that you can relate to it's like yeah i can do this too you yeah 100 percent. So, so i'm hoping for more you know so when you guys started your podcast so you guys at the moment are have you guys finished going through each other's like childhood what's the next season going to be about because you guys um, have so much to talk about your childhood you know pardon you guys have so much to talk about your childhood I'm just yeah i know what's... literally but, but it's I mean, good it's we, a good I mean, insight yeah we're only scratching the surface with a lot of things just because we knew we didn't want to talk but we don't want to talk about ourselves for so long so we mm. tried to cut down a lot um we, I think for this season, I think we have two more episodes we need nice. to record, but because of the current times, it has been really difficult to link up, like coming out of lockdown and then back into lockdown. Back, back <laughs> into lockdown. Yeah, it's just, it's been really difficult to link up, but um, yeah, fingers crossed we get that done soon. And we actually haven't discussed what season two will look like yet. So that's something really exciting that we need to maybe, talk about. Maybe you can um clarify a rumor for me then. Is it true that... The Prime Minister said she'd be on your podcast when you guys start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Clarify the this Prime with Minister me, please. She said she'd be on our podcast, but she said she was excited about our podcast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was like, because, you, bro, you should cash that in right now. Yeah. I mean, it'll be I the have, perfect I time. I have a letter from the Prime Minister, and she said, very excited to listen and to, po to Untouched Faces. That's and cool. she said it'd be a great resource for people to see um a pacifica worldview so yeah that's exciting <laughs> that is exciting that's cool how do you guys come up with the name untouched spaces oh um yeah i think you probably had the same issue it is really hard coming up with well, an a original name, original name, name yeah. yeah and you're stuck with it like you need to make sure it's something you're gonna love and continue to love so we were talking a lot about our purpose and um what we wanted to discuss on on um on our podcast and emma actually said man we're really talking about untouched spaces and that's literally we just looked at each other and we're like that's the name because we're talking about things that is often goes unsaid because it's just mm. lived experiences by us um mm. that we all don't need to talk about to know that we've all been through them but i think it is so important that we talk about it and we get our stories out there mm. and that we ensure that our youth and also those who are walking before us um, know that their stories are acknowledged and a lot of people are going through what they've been through or what they are going through. Mm. So, it's, it's more than just stories though, isn't it? Like for me, I think hearing opinions, hearing people's yeah. opinions to whatever's happening in the world, um, hearing a Pacifica view uh, and opinion about what's happening in the world to me is such a, such a rarity. Rarity. Yeah, is that a word? Rarity. Yeah, it is a word. Just, rare, okay, rarity. Jeez, like rarity. That didn't sound right, but <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is quite rare. You know, it's like hearing like um, because because what I try to do now is I try to bring people on, so I can ask them you know certain questions or or ask an opinion about something that probably you you you'll find it quite difficult to find anywhere else. 
Yeah. Right. And especially from a Pacifica point of view and podcasting seems to be that space where there's no restrictions, right? Mm -hmm. You are in complete control and anyone can do it. It's very similar yeah. to, to um, starting YouTube, you know, anyone yeah. can do it. So I, I'm actually so excited to hear what, what's next coming up um, with you guys, because so far you guys have been ridiculously hilarious and there's some stuff I can relate to. Cause I, like I said, like I grew up, in Tonga, but I did finish my, my final year of high school here. I didn't finish, You're I bombed out, but I did go to school here yeah. in my yeah. final year. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, I hung out at the tuck shop too, and I did buy a whole bunch <laughs> of random shit. And yeah. Yeah, the worst was the scabbers. You just try oh. <laughs> as soon as you buy something, it's like, bro, can I get half your sandwich? Like, how about you piss off? It's Far like, around. I'm going to collect all these coins for you to come and ask exactly. me. Exactly. Exactly. You know, the yeah. funniest story I heard from your podcast was your story of stealing Hale's lunch. And, oh. <laughs> and you know when I was I think I was at work and I was driving around and I was just like yeah. what a sad <laughs> no because I know my parents are just gonna buy her another lunch it's still I was just like, that is sad <laughs> so listen I'm not gonna ruin it but like listen I think anyone who you know any of the listeners out there definitely check out you know Un Untouched Spaces it is a gem it's definitely got hey. a lot of good stuff uh, going on there at the hey, moment yeah. so listen I, over the last couple of podcasts. There's a lot of stuff happening in New Zealand at the moment, especially in politics, right? Yeah. So I'm quite interested to find out what's your take at the moment on the current climate of, of politics? Do you think um, Jacinda Ardern's a good prime minister? Is she is that if is what she done with the COVID response enough for you to vote for her again? What, what where, where do you stand on politics at the moment? Um, you know, I really um. I really think that Jacinda Ardern has done an extremely amazing job with coronavirus and COVID just because I look at how other countries are experiencing it. I mean, I looked as close as our neighbor, Australia, and they're really suffering. Mm. And I just feel so lucky to be in the position that we are in. And I think that is due a lot to her leadership and how quickly she's responded. And it's not only just her response to COVID-19, it's also her response to the Christchurch attacks with the mosque, like she's shown time and time again how quickly and how um, how amazingly she's responded to these things that a lot of other prime ministers have never, oh, maybe any prime minister has ever had to deal with. Um, in saying that, I have been seeing a lot of things against her leadership and a lot of conspiracy theories and stuff oh, like not that. The conspiracy theories. Yeah, I know. Like honestly, the conspiracy theories are I'm all tired over the place. I'm tired of conspiracy social theories. Media. It's just, it's just so it's really hard for me to read because I heard um one of the Tongan presenters on five thirty one. She said, Would you rather oh, it's better that you rest at home than you rest in peace Which is literally <laughs> <laughs> Which is literally Put that on a t-shirt. Put that on a t-shirt. Put that no, on a t-shirt. Rest at, better sentence. to rest at home or rest in peace. Oh, yeah. that's classic. And I was like, it just had to be a Tonga to say. <laughs> but I was like, that's it. That's encapsulated in one sentence. Like our lives are on the line, you know? And we are seeing it in other countries how badly it can go. Mm. So even if you do think it's all a hoax or something, there's no we don't have any chances with this. If it goes bad, it's going to go really bad. So, mm. yeah, I think that's my take on everything. It's we, we just rest at home because we don't want to rest, <laughs> rest at home. Better to rest at home than rest in peace. Oh, yeah, my. exactly. <laughs> Classic. That's the best phrase. No, no, no. I I would have to say that I am very impressed with the initial response to the coronavirus. I, I mean, that's just evident, right? Evident in yeah. how well we've we've sort of brought the numbers down and how quick we were able to sort of get out of lockdown. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, listen, I'm I'm trying to be more pay more attention to politics these days, you know, um, because I know how much it actually affects me. Us. You know, yeah. uh, you know, it, it, it's yeah, us as New Zealanders and as you know, um, Pacifica people. Um, yeah, and and it's a difficult one because from a health point of view, I am all for this lockdown, right? I do yeah. believe that the virus is actually here. I do believe that it's it's going to be very, you know, uh, if it's going to if it ran throughout Pacifica communities, it's going to run rampant. Yeah, you know, 
um, I'm, I'm all for that. Um, I guess what, but I'm also quite empathetic to business owners and things where they sort of yeah. think, oh, yeah, you know, we, we've barely made it through the last lockdown and lockdown. here we are again, um, yeah. going back into lockdown. So I can feel their pain and feel their, their hurt. And I, yeah. I, I don't know what, what the answer is, you know, because yeah. I do believe yeah. there, there could be a possible worse issue than the coronavirus, which is the collapse of, of the economy, you know, the collapse mm -hmm. of our, of our society because mm -hmm. of this lockdown, you yeah. know, um, and whether that will have much more long lasting impacts than the coronavirus, I'm not sure, but that's something that I'm quite wary I'll about. Yeah. I guess I don't hear, uh, I, I know the stimulus packages and things like that, but there's not a lot of convincing discussion going on from the labor government about how they're going to manage that. They have, yeah. they have quite serious, um, serious uh, policies around the coronavirus, which I appreciate. Like I said, mm. I work in health. I, I, I am definitely all for, you know, um, protection and safety of, of the vulnerable. Um, yeah. But also, I realize there is things outside of the virus that needs to be considered. Yeah. You know, we do have to think of life after the virus. We do have yeah. to think about jobs and employment you know we do have to think of all these things because they come part and parcel with we go into lockdown right yeah yeah now there's no easy way forward which kind of sucks for her as a prime minister because like you said she's you know in her short term as prime minister she's dealt with some serious serious issues some big yeah. big issues yeah know, world changing issues the shooting yeah. in christchurch changed the, the new zealand mindset forever you know, yeah. the way yeah. that we perceive New Zealand, that changed it forever. Now, forever. there's certain things where I didn't agree with what she did. Um, but I think her response to trying to unite the New Zealand, the New, Ze New Zealand was, was, was a message well received from a lot of people, mm. um, regardless of where you sit on, you know, on which side of the aisle, whether you're sitting on the right side or left side, or, or you're in the middle, you know, yeah. her message of, of being united was one that a lot of people can get behind on. Yeah, you know, and then not too long after that, here we go. We have, we have the COVID. we have COVID, and and you know she's she's dealing with it as best she can. Is she the yeah. best prime minister we've had? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Probably mm -hmm. not. But has she sort of sort of stood up and tried to manage all the shit that's sort of been presented to her? She definitely has. She's yeah. definitely put in all the work that anyone in her position can do to try and manage what's in front of her. Um, and listen, I can't tell the future, right? So I don't yeah. know how our society is going to look. And I said this before at the beginning of, of the first coronavirus, of the first lockdown, sorry, that I'm not sure what the, what our society is going to look like after we come out of lockdown, you know, mm -hmm. after we come out. And, you know, luckily we came out and everything went back to normal pretty, pretty fucking quick, you know, yeah. it just went pff, yeah. like, like it never happened. But now we've got this is a stark reminder that actually there is still there's still things happening, you know. Yeah. So we need to sort of be quite aware of that. So yeah, I'm I'm impressed with her on that. Um, but then again, people like prime ministers who are sort of in in sort of um, who seems overly popular. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not wording that right. I'm always wary of prime ministers who tend to sort of take to popularity a little bit too well you know mm, okay you know, yeah I'd, you know because and this is just my own thinking like like popularity is such a intoxicating thing to have mm. you know being loved by everyone and being sort of you know being hailed as you know as one of the best prime ministers out there you know that mm -hmm. New Zealand's ever seen so your focus can oh well can easily change to i want to maintain popularity so what can I do to keep these people happy? You know, because right. I, I get what people, you know, in terms of the government and, and the role of the government, it, it is to provide, you know, to seek out what the population wants and mm -hmm. sort of implement mm -hmm. that into sort of legislation or, or you know, or sort of implement that and, and protect the rights of, of people. But at the same time, they, you know, the government's role is also to so, you know, is also to protect our, um, society well-being yeah yeah so it, it's it's like being being popular you you can sort of lose that sort of perspective in a way i'm probably not explaining it right but there's sort of like what what i'm 
one of the things how you feel being, oh, 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 being overly popular you know yeah because sometimes you don't you can't really get the job done if you know what i mean mm. in, in a weird way i, I, I know i'm I not, like, not explaining it well but yeah i feel like the reason why she is so popular though is because she really is for the people well that's how i see her like mm. She's doing a lot of Facebook lives and she's trying to connect with as many people as possible to ensure that the message is getting out hmm. in an acceptable way. Um, yeah, possibly. And, and look, I could, I could have all of this wrong and I'm more than happy to be sort of told otherwise. Um, it's just like, I, I just don't, and it's not just her. I don't trust yeah. the government in general that yeah. they actually have our best interests at heart in, in general. You know, okay. It has nothing to do with okay. like national or, or labor. I think at the end of the day, I think to a certain point, they are self-serving because that's just how the government is sort of formed. You only have, what, three years, three years in government. Yeah. You're not really, and, and this is also me being very cynical, <laughs> you're not really looking to sort of provide policies and sort of implement interventions that's going to last long you're looking to put in short-term gains for the next election right because you right. have to present something for a reason for you to be voted back in you know and right. like most things that's impactful for a society you need to be making plans that's going to be 10 plus years, a long time right yeah and, yeah and, and and that's not labor's fault that's not you know any other sort of political party's fault that's just how our government is, is, is structured you know whether that's the yeah. right way i don't know but it's definitely something that i think impacts how decisions are being made whether i'm right or wrong yeah. Who that's, knows? that's a fair point that's a fair point that is a that is a fair point if there's one thing that i do want to note on on the mm. current political climate is that what's come up a lot is that youth aren't voting so yes. do you think voting is important oh absolutely there's okay. no other there's no other way to sort of get your voice heard yeah. than, than voting you know, so, listen, yeah. I can sit here, talk shit all day. It actually doesn't matter because if I don't go out and vote, it actually literally, does, it, it literally, literally doesn't count. So regardless of where you sit, I think, especially, listen, especially youth, Pacifica youth, we need to be in there. We need to be voting, you know, yeah, whichever way you feel. Say, yeah. Pardon? Yeah, I was about to say, whichever way people feel that is best for them and their families, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I say pay attention as well. You know, yeah. follow follow yeah. what the policies are. Follow what yeah. what what these parties actually make an want. Make informed decision. Make, yeah, make an informed decision. As hard as that is, because you know it's it's not easy to access what each political party stands for. You know, it's not yeah. like America where they have all the groups of people debate each other in one sitting, and then you know, and then you have yeah. two major parties have major debates. Ours is structured a little bit more differently. Yeah. Um, so e even the voting system and how we vote someone in is a little bit different, right? Yeah. So I think as best as you can make an informed decision about which political party suits your values, you know, yeah. that cater and to your values. Definitely vote because I think the stats were 50% of youth didn't vote in the last election and Pacifica, the Pacifica population is a young population so we're a youthful population which means that a lot of our youth aren't voting and a lot of the youth of Aotearoa aren't voting so please get your voice heard yeah by voting please and roll to vote right roll. now yeah That's i think the they need to make it a little bit more process. easier they, they need to make the voting process a little bit more easier um yeah i had to drag my mom to the voting booth <laughs> I was like, you're going to vote, and you're going to vote today. So I walked with her people's all the way to college. Because people's to votes count. Vote. They Pardon? actually, the, people's yeah, votes for count. Sure. You know? Yeah. Your one vote could be that one vote Deciding that swings votes. who takes out Auckland or, who, you know. Um, especially, you know, great, great uh, segue into what I was going to ask you next. It, you know, in, in the referendums, you know, the next two big referendums yeah. that's coming through. Yeah. What's your thoughts on the cannabis referendum? I mean, I haven't done a lot of research. That's fine. It's, it, I mean, but everyone either... knows what cannabis is, right? Yeah. Everyone knows what cannabis is. Yeah. Hey, hey, Nelly. I haven't, everyone I haven't knows done... what cannabis is, hey. Especially my neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dealer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, haven't, I haven't done a lot of research on either of the referendums, mm. which is something 
I really need to do because yeah. as I just said, I need to vote and I need to make an informed vote. I need to do what I'm saying. But yeah, um, I'm not quite sure. I recently heard from, I went to a conference the other week and Chloe Swarbrick was one of the uh, speakers mm. and she spoke about the cannabis referendum and you know, I found it. Re I found it really interesting, but I honestly don't want to say anything yet because I have not looked into it enough mm. at all. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's that's fine. Like my opinion is, my my I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent confident in what I'm going to do. Like at the mm -hmm. moment, I'm sitting on the gonna vote yes, yeah, the referendum, um, yeah, but yeah, but my mind, because I don't have a strong opinion on it, because I'm neither here nor there about cannabis. Yes, you know, um, I can see. Which kind of puts me in a good position because I can see both sides of it. I can see Chloe Swarbrick. She's a very articulate, smart woman, like ridiculously yeah. good, right? She 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 can advocate the living. She's been advocating the living shit about cannabis and very convincingly, right? Yeah. On the other side of things, you don't have a lot. <laughs> you don't have a lot of people arguing the other side, right? Yeah. You have out of touch old white people, white men even. You know, talking mm. about cannabis, and they have no lived experience, no idea about what cannabis is. Probably <laughs> smoked it once, and that's where they're informing the decision on. Right. But on the other hand, I was listening to, and I did share a video on my Twitter uh, about a debate on on TP Plus, um, where Ranji and Reverend Mua was was having a conversation. So Ranji is is a South Oakland uh, social worker. I think he also did degree in law and stuff like that. Um, yeah arguing against cannabis and okay. he, he came with quite a lot of very compelling and interesting arguments about why we shouldn't legalize cannabis which is an argument i don't really hear yeah um yeah so i'm i'm desperately trying to get him on the podcast but you know it's <laughs> like his his argument is a lot to do with why are we legalizing it when we already have alcohol issues methamphetamine issues you know, okay. we're just going to bring in another drug that we can't even manage. You know, I mean, I mean, he, yeah. he, he does it a lot more articulate than that. You right. Know, and he has statistics to back up what he's saying. I find his his explanation and his point of view a I'm going to say unique, unique in the sense that you don't hear a lot of people speaking evidently against it. Yeah. You know, in, in a very compelling and coherent way you hear like sort of half ass sort of people talk about oh cannabis is not good because it's going to make people lazy it's like well i'm lazy already you know i don't need cannabis yeah. to help me with that but yeah yeah you know but like actual proper discussions and he's probably going to be a person that's going to be very interesting to hear because he works with the youth he works with people who, yeah who have issues and he works with people who use cannabis and you know quote unquote whether you believe this or not you it became a gateway into using harder harsher drugs you mm -hmm. know not to mention the mental health implications that come hand in hand with cannabis as well you know yeah so it, it's gonna be interesting so uh, who knows you know i i was i'm still fairly confident that it'll pass just because, like you say, there's a lot of uh, the the youth numbers have increased quite drastically, and I think if you look at the numbers of people who's using cannabis, yeah, it's the youth, you know. So I think if the youth, if they can go and out and vote, you know, if they're gonna vote right, for anything, yeah. this is probably one of the things yeah, they should literally. vote for. <laughs> you know, um, I think there's a, there's a good chance this can, you know, this help this process mm. progress a little bit further down the line. So that's that. What about the other one? What about the end of life bill? You know, yeah, I, uh, you it's a really difficult on one. It, it comes up a lot at church. Um, our Catholic is, I mean, our family yeah. is Catholic, very Catholic. And I go to mm. Sunday mass with my family every week. So, um, yeah, it definitely does come up a lot at church. Um, and it is really difficult because in, our, in the stance of our church, we're totally against it, you know, mm. as Catholics. Um um, but I do hear and see the other side again, the same thing, with the cannabis one. So it's, I, I think what it will come down to is how, how it's written maybe, but from what I'm seeing and how it's been mocked up, it just doesn't mm. look super safe. It just looks quite loose. It's super broad. It's, it's too super broad. broad. So I just, yeah. I don't really have a lot of faith in it. But again, I haven't done enough research. But the little amount that I have done 
yeah, it's yeah. really broad. You're probably just like everyone else, though. You know, you, you and me are sort of. I, I classify myself as your. My knowledge base is what yeah. your everyday yeah. person on the street would know, right? Every, you know, so that's that's kind of roughly where I'd like to sort of put my sort of political thoughts and ideas. Is that I don't have vast experience, and I don't sit and read every political article that comes out on news talk TV right. or or Which the probably Herald, not a good place you know, to and, and analyze it. <laughs> <laughs> no 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 but like but you know i don't i, I don't sit there looking for like right. articles about okay. politics or opinion pieces or what have you right i i listen to people speak i listen to politicians like chloe swarbrick sort of like argue her point i watch um people like ronji um mm -hmm. talk about his point of view and i sort of formulate from my own personal experiences as well where i sit right and i'm like you it's in terms of the end of life bill I, i'm in two minds about this a i've worked with people who at the end of their life, I've, I've worked in, in palliative care and I'm just like, ah, uh, yeah, no, I can see how this would be the, you know, you know, where maybe getting them to choose when to end their life in a dignified yeah. way yeah. makes sense, right? But the other side of the thing is, I also, even though I don't go to church <laughs> as much as you, <laughs> I do, I, I, I do believe, you know, I, I did grow up Catholic yeah. and I do hold Catholic values and I can't, I can't yeah. find that middle ground yeah. between the, the two, time. right? Because depending, it doesn't even matter how you sort of look at it. If if you if you're Catholic, it it you you won't yeah. be able to find that middle ground because there's there's actually there no, no middle ground. Yeah, it's black and no white. It's black and white yeah. for killing yourself. It, it's it's quite black or white. So then it comes down to even if you argue yeah. from a moral point of view, right? You know. You know, do you do, you know, where do you sit? So that's going to be a hard one, I think. I think that the end of life bill will be a much more harder decision yeah. to make than the cannabis. Um, because, you know, I, I value yeah. life. Life is valuable and intrinsically valuable to, to everyone. And, um, you know, but then again, um, I've worked with people and I have one of my downfalls. Is yeah. I, I'm so empathetic, you know. I'm, I'm yeah. just overly empathetic with with pe you know with people who are in that that stage of life where you know they know they they've got a terminal illness they've been given this amount of time and they're in horrible yeah. horrible pain you know and dignity seems to be one of the last things that a lot of yeah. people right. want yeah. in their final days you know and how do we give that I don't know you know, is, is this bill going to be the right bill? And it may be, as you say, maybe it's they need to relook at it and make it more specific because the negative implications of having a bill like this, having it too general, can be quite vast, yeah, especially in yeah, mental health for circles. Sure. You know? So you're right. So it's, it's interesting. So you're just like yeah. everyone else who's undecided. <laughs> On a lot of things. <laughs> like me. <laughs> like like the end of life bill, I'm undecided. No, but but it's, it's good to, like, it's conversations that need to be happy they need to be had because you know aside from everyone who you know who watches the tp plus episodes mm -hmm. on the Africa, where there's debates about you know um politics and all that stuff which is which is really good unfortunately too short to actually get gritty. into like yeah. in the details of it all you know, <laughs> i say nitty-gritty too <laughs> the nitty-gritty nitty of it all nitty-gritty yeah <laughs> not sure yeah uh, best best movie but like but you know it, it's one of those it's one of those topics where it's like well let's at least have a conversation about it let's let's talk about it let's see at the end of the conversation where our opinions stand and whether mm. it aligns with this mm. or if it aligns with that. yeah but it, it is difficult especially when you come from such a catholic background going back to the, yeah it's just yes yeah, difficult mm. struggle but you know decisions need to be made and some prayers need to be said. Decisions do need to be made, and <laughs> exactly, you know, whatever, whatever comes through, I hope it does benefit whoever yeah. it's intentioned. You know what, what the intention yeah. was behind it. You know, the the true spirit of what this referendum is trying to sort of um, pursue. I hope that's what actually comes about it, as opposed to just opening the door to a massive Literally. shit show that could Literally. sort of <laughs> sort of happen if 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 not done properly. You know. So listen, I I pre list Jesus. We've been on oh, for damn. two two hours and ten minutes. I didn't minutes. realize. Holy, I 
No, it, it's been really interesting. It's really good because I don't think we've actually sat down and had like a proper in-depth. Mind you, who does have long yeah. in-depth conversations yeah. about stuff, right? But listen, Janelle, I've been really happy been having you on the podcast. An honor. Um, your insight into you know the your the insight into your sort of your experiences, the law degree, you know, um, your mentoring, your work with Edmund Rice camps, you know, your vlogging. You know, you're podcasting. Jeez, you are a very busy woman. You know, I do appreciate you taking out the time to be on the podcast, even if I had to use the cousin card to bring no, you on. No, not at all. It's an <laughs> honor and a privilege to be here, Gio. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so listen, where can we find all your vlogs and 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 also your podcast? What what are the links okay. that we that most of can my find personal stuff? On? I just use my name, so everything's under Janelle Augsburg. Um, and then the podcast, search up Untouched Spaces. It's on all streaming pa- platforms. Can we get a, a rough estimate of when we can get the final oh, two episodes? I think that depends on how long Level 3 goes for. <laughs> okay, so fingers crossed things things yeah. don't um, take too long because I am personally oh, waiting sorry for the next that. one okay, to yeah. and come through. Okay. For you, for you, we'll get it done. <laughs> Make it quick, all right? <laughs> <laughs> No, but like I said, oh, you can find this, the, this episode oh, cool. should be coming out on Monday. So you can find it on all the usual stuff um, on Instagram and Facebook uh, at the Thought Plantation Podcast. I seem to be oh, more nice. active on Twitter I, I'm these days. Follow. I became your hundredth. I, I became your hundredth follower. I just got became your hundredth um, follower, by the way. I just, oh, I just nice. On uh, yeah, I don't use Twitter on too Twitter. much, but I'm just, I want to get back into it because I feel like everyone yeah. over there is much more open minded. <laughs> yeah. On Twitter? Really? Oh, the people no I follow. Way. Are you kidding me? I yeah. Well, you probably follow. You created an <laughs> echo chamber for yourself, my friend. <laughs> I I left Twitter a while back because it just became too, too. Oh, much. okay. I'm not on. I'm not in those places on Twitter about no. stupid things. Yeah, I got <laughs> I got dragged into it. I I I'm, I can't claim 100 percent innocence. I did like throw out really provocative <laughs> tweets back in the day, so. But yeah, you can find. I'm, I'm seem to be active on Twitter more these days, but I'm more active on Instagram. But on Twitter, you can find me at T Plantation Pod, because Thought Plantation Podcast was already taken, I think. Which is oh, no, no, okay. it was too long. Okay. It was too long to be a Twitter handle. So T Plantation Pod is um, my Twitter handle. Um, again, Instagram, Facebook, Thought Plantation Podcast. Thank, Thank you, you, Janelle, for again for being on the podcast been. and sharing your insights. Definitely need to have you back on with with <laughs> Delta and Emma, and we can talk about you know the progression. Of <laughs> yeah, the hard out. Sometime down Thanks the line. so much for having me. Honestly, I love listening to your podcast, no, so I've... it really is an honor to to be here and be interviewed by you. <laughs> oh, 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 stop it, stop it. No, but thank you again, and uh, take care of being out in South Auckland. <laughs> oh, you know? oh my God! <laughs> take it easy. <laughs> <laughs>